Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. Gostaríamos de dar início ao seminário Gig Economy e gostaríamos de agradecer a presença de todas as autoridades, em especial o ilustre professor, doutor, diretor Celso Fernandes Campilongo. Gostaríamos de agradecer também ao professor Antônio Rodrigues de Freitas Júnior, à professora Adriana Calvo, à doutora Elizabeth Tippett e aos doutores Antônio Pérez, do Robortella, advogados do escritório, Aline Marques Fidelis, do escritório Itaú e Felipe Vasconcelos, sócio da LBS Advogados e Advogadas. E aproveitamos também para anunciar que hoje será o lançamento do livro Glossário Jurídico Trabalhista, de Augustus Bonner Cochran e João Renda Leal Fernandes. Entraremos em maiores detalhes sobre o livro ainda nesse evento. E agora passo a palavra ao professor Freitas. Bom dia, Bom dia a todos e todas. É uma alegria poder dar início a esse evento que está sendo alentado e organizado há mais de seis meses, desde o final do ano passado, uh, voltado a um tema que nós suspeitávamos que ia ser importante a essa altura do campeonato, que é o tema do trabalho sobre demanda em plataformas digitais, Uber, etc., etc., and, uh, e também o um, um problema sempre relevante da intensificação do processo de precarização das relações de trabalho. Senhor diretor, uma alegria contar com a sua presença, com o seu prestígio na abertura desse evento. É, quero também anunciar a presença dos demais convidados, professores de fora, o professor August Cochran, do Agnes College, o professor Samuel Streicher, da New York University, o professor Mohamed, da Universidade, da Universidade do Oregon, é, da minha querida colega e a nossa verdadeira organizadora executiva, a doutora Adriana Calvo. Senhor diretor, por favor. Muito, muito bom dia a todas, muito bom dia a todos. É motivo de grande alegria, de grande satisfação para a Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de São Paulo uh, sediar este evento. Eu gostaria em primeiríssimo lugar, de dar as boas-vindas de modo muito especial a todos os colegas estrangeiros aqui, aqui presentes e, e parabenizar de modo muito especial ao meu querido colega de tempos de graduação, de graduação, não digo nem de que século, o Freitas é meu, é meu amigo, mas meu amigo há mais de um século, eu diria. Uh, uh, e é uma, uma alegria uh, participar da abertura de um evento que tem por coordenadores o professor Antônio Rodrigues de Freitas Júnior e a professora Elizabeth Tippett. Uh, organizado este encontro, como já falou o Freitas, pela doutora Adriana, Adriana Calvo. Não fosse a satisfação de uh, participar de um evento com esta importância, desta magnitude internacional e discutindo temas de, de tamanha relevância, acho que o, o fato de nós trazermos para o âmbito do direito do trabalho um debate que tem um impacto, digamos, devastador, fulminante, ou a palavra da moda, disruptivo, em praticamente todas as áreas do direito, e não apenas no direito, no direito do trabalho, por si só é de enorme relevância. No século em que eu conheci o professor Freitas, era muito comum, e aqui perto, por exemplo, na rua Boa Vista, a 300, 400 metros daqui, onde funcionava, digamos, o, o centro financeiro da cidade de São Paulo, mas também um poderoso sindicato, que é o Sindicato dos Bancários. Praticamente todo mês eu tinha na Rua Boa Vista manifestações importantíssimas dos bancários. Olha, eu não, 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 não posso dizer com precisão, mas eu imagino que uma, a última greve que os bancários fizeram, se não tiver uma década, está perto disso. Praticamente, nos últimos anos, aquela formatação sindical convencional 
pensada para uma economia anterior às plataformas, anterior à digitalização, anterior à inteligência artificial, nada disso praticamente sobreviveu à época em que a Rua Boa Vista tinha praticamente uma manifestação por semana. A forma de tratamento, de negociação, de encaminhamento dos conflitos coletivos ganhou uma dinâmica jurídica muito diferente. Imagino eu que estes temas apareçam num seminário que falará sobre direitos sociais, tecnologia, uh, mudanças e regulação jurídica das relações de trabalho, das relações de emprego, das relações entre trabalho e capital. Uh, portanto, eu queria desejar e já antecipadamente dizer que tenho certeza absoluta que este encontro renderá bons frutos à, à Faculdade de Direito, a todos os participantes, e espero que, a partir deste seminário, outros possam ser feitos. Professor Feitas, eu sei que faz um trabalho muito intensivo com algumas universidades uh, norte-americanas. Eu gostaria de dizer ao Freitas, nem precisaria, tô, gostaria de dizer de público isto, que este trabalho é visto pela faculdade como um trabalho de enorme relevância, de enorme impacto, e que a faculdade não poupará esforços para dar continuidade a este trabalho, seja aqui, seja nas universidades parceiras da Faculdade de Direito nos Estados Unidos ou, ou onde for no, no mundo. Estas coisas todas têm um impacto no direito do trabalho e, evidentemente, no ensino do direito do trabalho. Mas tem um impacto extraordinário sobre o ensino jurídico como um todo. Nós estamos passando por um momento, dentre outras coisas, neste momento, nós estamos discutindo a revisão das diretrizes curriculares do curso de Direito. Ora, a discussão como a que será travada aqui no, nas próximas horas é uma discussão central para que a gente possa promover uma revisão do ensino jurídico nos modos do que, existe, do que exige uma, uma sociedade que lida com inteligência artificial, com plataformas digitais, com redes sociais, com novas formas de trabalho e de emprego. Então, contem com o apoio integral, o apoio incondicional da Faculdade de Direito para estas atividades. Eu desejo a todos um excelente seminário e agradeço muitíssimo a todos os organizadores, aos presentes e, de modo particular, aos nossos convidados estrangeiros. Sejam todos muito bem-vindos a este seminário. Muito obrigado. Antes de dissolver a mesa solene de abertura, eu quero registrar a presença da professora Elizabeth Tippett, pela, uh, vocês estão vendo aqui, da Universidade do Oregon, que estará conosco na, no primeiro painel que ocorrerá logo na sequência. Professor, Celso Campinolo, mais uma vez, muito obrigado por prestigiar o nosso evento, é uma alegria tê-lo aqui e vamos trabalhar. Bom dia a todos e todas. Bom, meus, meus caros e caras, antes de nós ultimarmos as providências necessárias a ficar em conexão com a Liz Tepet, no Oregon, eu queria aproveitar esse ensejo para agradecer enfaticamente a contribuição de alguns e algumas colegas, sem cujo apoio, sem cuja contribuição, sem cuja colaboração, esse evento não seria possível. Eu começo agradecendo o escritório Tawil tá, Shecker, especialmente na pessoa da doutora Aline Fidelis, é, e também da doutora Isabel Deva que está aqui fazendo às vezes a nosso pedido, a nosso rogo de, de cerimonial, é, contribuindo também pelo evento. Quero, evidentemente, agradecer enfaticamente a organização executiva da Adriana Cal. A Adriana começou a trabalhar nesse projeto quando esteve na Universidade do Oregon, é, em, como parte das atribuições do seu estágio pós-doutoral aqui na Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de São Paulo, sob minha supervisão, e conseguiu o contato com diversos professores importantes formadores de opinião, influentes professores, proeminentes professores, que nos abrilhantarão com as suas contribuições, com as suas apresentações. Uh, estão aqui presentes, como já foi anunciado, o professor 
uh, Samuel Strachan, o professor Augusto Cochran, o professor Mohamed Elias, da Universidade do Ara, e entre outros tantos colegas que estão aqui nos honrando com a sua presença. Temos, portanto, uma plateia extraordinariamente qualificada. Também ao ensejo eu quero agradecer a importante contribuição das, da equipe dos meus orientandos e orientandas, a equipe, portanto, do programa de pós-graduação e dos colegas do GENDIT, do Grupo de Estudos de Migração e Direito Internacional do Trabalho. E eu faço na pessoa da doutora Aline Mandarim, que está aqui conosco, da doutora Aline Paixão, que está também aqui conosco, a Alice Swedes. Welcome, Professor Alice. I'm just in the uh, in the beginning of this session, just making my my thanks to uh, students, colleagues, and supervisees. Uh, uh, também uh, quero agradecer a uh, a contribuição da Letícia Zopola, que está por aqui, deve estar por aqui em algum. Ok, Letícia, obrigado mais uma vez. A uh, Mariana dos Anjos, que está aqui também entre outros tantos que seguramente eu esquecerei, como de resto, ordinariamente esqueço de agradecer. É, eu sempre compareço com, essa, com esses tropeços de cerimonial, porque realmente formalidades a esse tipo não são próprias da minha personalidade, da minha formação. É, quero agradecer a, também a contribuição, a parceria da Associação dos Advogados de São Paulo e, uma vez mais, do escritório da Will Shecker. É, portanto, feitos esses agradecimentos... So, my dear friend, Professor Lee Stippet, we're going to start our second session, the first um, of this morning. Uh, I would like to thank you again for all your um, contribution to this, to this event, to this seminar, not, long, not only as an organizer, as a coordinator or co-coordinator, but also as some, some, something Uh, that I have to tell you, Professor Lee Stippet has already lectured for five days, five mornings in this room about a couple of years ago, before the end of the world with the pandemic. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, all by it, not personally. But anyway, we are here still uh, with um, a lot of colleagues from different uh, law firms and students that uh, are joining us today. Well, uh, so on behalf of the Department of Labor Law and Social Security and of the University of Sao Paulo Grad Studies Program, uh, I repeat, uh, it's for me a delightful pleasure and a great honor to start this morning the seminar Gig Economy, Social Rights, Technology Change and Legal Regulation. During the Portuguese opening ceremony, I devoted some minutes to thank the members of the organizing committee, university staff, colleagues, and legal practitioners that accepted our invitation to join us in this opportunity. Now, I have to add some uh, mentions. We are hugely delighted to announce the, the presence and the presentations. Uh, by professors from different universities and institutions, such as the University of Sao Paulo Business School, FEA, University of Campinas, Unicamp, Rio de Janeiro State University, UERJ, Federal University of Paraná, uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Sao Paulo School of Law, INSPER, Labor Prosecution School of Advanced Studies, side by side with labor court ju judges, labor prosecutors, and other legal practitioners in the field of labor and employment law. Well, also thanks to their generosity and the possibility to come personally, sorry, sorry for that, um, to join us personally in this seminar, I must highlight our huge gratitude to Professor Samuel Streicher um, from the New York University, to Professor Mohamed Elian from the University of Oregon, and for the Emeritus Professor August Bonner Cochran from the Scott Agnes Scott College. I shall also express our delight and honor to have with us 
as I said, all by, by thematic, telematic means. Organizing this event, Professor uh, Elizabeth Tip from the University of Oregon, Professor Ana Virginia Moreira Gomes, which is now sharing uh, the ILO Latin America and Caribbean office. Uh, very, it's a very proud, of, we, we are very proud of this because she's a great friend, is a, a friend of us and of ours, and she is working with us in cooperation uh, in partnership with the University of Sao Paulo School of Law when she was, when she has been professor at the University of Fortaleza in E4. Um, Professor Catherine Fisk from the University of California at Berkeley, and Professor Vina Dubau from the University of California at Irvine. Unfortunately, Professor Vina Dubai couldn't stay uh, face to face with us uh, because of some, some problems she had to face. Uh, but anyway, she will be with us uh, by telematic means. Well, at the step of the ceremony, I also have to thank my dear friend Adriana Calvo, again Adriana Calvo, for such a dedicated commitment to this event. I mean, no, not only simply as an executive organizer, but as somebody that did her best to make these things happen, happen and happen the best way possible. Professor Liz Tippett is also, as I said, uh, in the special credits of this seminar, not only because of because she had suggested some of the presenters, but also because we have her close to us, we can totally sure that we're gonna be we're gonna have the best David best. My sincere apologies for the ones I as I told you in Portuguese that I unintendedly forget to mention. It's um, well, as I said, it's sort of tradition to forget them. So please forgive me in advance. Before Leaving the floor to Professor Elizabeth Tippett, I would like to, 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 to say a couple of words about the concept and the purpose of this seminar. Uh, when, I was, when I was researching about the co the on-demand work, the on-demand work mediated by digital platforms at Cornell University, ILR, in the 2018 spring term, I remember some intriguing questions a colleague, a, colleague, a colleague of mine asked me by that time, by the time I arrived in Ithaca, why was this topic suddenly become so popular? What explains why so many tables in the in sessions at international events are dedicated to debating this phenomenon? Is this a very lucrative business? Does it employ a lot of people? So let's try to go in parts. The first thing, yes, this is a business that quickly proved to be very profitable for the platform companies and progressively pre precarious for the workers, tax drivers. Until now, urban passengers, transport workers were independent contractors, without a doubt, independent contractors whose demand for labor was relatively predictable and stable. As soon as platform companies appeared, uh, willing to intermediate the work of these tax drivers, the scenario changed radically, very fast. Not without a lot of resistance from tax drivers, not without street movements, riots, not without a passive but apprehensive look for, from public authorities. Taxi drivers fearful for losing their job, the job market, a fear that would quickly prove to be justified to a certain extent. Public authorities fearful of losing tax revenues and control of, over urban traffic, which would also be confirmed. And platform companies claiming to be the target of misunderstanding and legal uncertainty. The platform companies saw themselves as the owners of a disruptive technology with no ties to drivers nor to users. The version of the platforms must sound reasonable in abstract terms. 
But in view of millions of dollars, the platforms were accumulating very fast. It was gradually becoming less convincing. At that time, I remember academic research placing the phenomenon in the so-called sharing economy. Remember that, Professor Lee's sharing economy was the, the place to, to locate this phenomenon. Nowadays, however, it, uh, I, I would recommend you colleagues to go back to the, that database, database and search for the term sharing economies, please, on the end platform work. You will see that this was the first uh, prevailing pattern. Nowadays, contrary to that or differently from that, we locate the phenomenon of platform work and what we call gig economy in the field of precariousness and precarity of work. What big change are we listening today? Instead of sharing economy, there's a broad international consensus on locating the phenomenon of on-demand platform work in the gig economy, as I told you. And this makes a big difference if we look at the phenomenon from the point of view of the legal regulation and of the social protection. This is not an activity in which kids come with some formulas to share urban transportation vehicles, not an initiative with an eye on the environmentally and urbanistically sustainable proposals whatsoever. Now, this is a lucrative business that economically exploits workers and has a significant impact on the country's economy, on urban landscape, and on the big cities commuting system. Just to give you an example, the way I practice the test regulating the nature of the labor relationship between workers and platform. I often ask my students, when you see the countless motorcycles and, the cy and cyclists uh, who rise around the big cities delivering pizzas, do you honestly recognize them, these boys and girls in flip-flops, the paradigm of an entrepreneur, of an uh, independent contractor? Independent contractors, 1099 is saying yes, uh, and self-employer as uh, using the British uh, nomenclature. Well, in other words, we have, on the other hand, some characteristics through which the economic exploitation of on-demand work and platforms operate pose a major problem for legal practitioners. How to provide social protection through the classic social protection tools of labor law conceived to regulate industrial employment relationship, how to make it effective, how to make, uh, to make it uh, useful. The dilemmatic and to a certain extent apparatic character, which are the different figures of economy, of economy of the big proposed to us constitutes the object of the challenge of this seminar it is not our ambition to conclude this seminar with any definitive or consensual answer, as probably you have already realized. We are glad to put together during these two days a prominent team of researchers to work focus on, focusing on identifying the most important questions that we have to face, trying to study the phenomena under different disciplinary perspectives with no purpose to advocate a legal doctrinal solution for carefully examine, before carefully examining it, examining it under the economic, social, political, and humanitarian perspective. So, dear friends, colleagues, students, allow me just a final remark in this opening session. My dear democracy lovers, committed to the rule of law and to the respect of diversity, we shall once more remember the tragedy of 1964 civil military coup, the brutal deposition of the legally elected former president, João Goulart, that took place in Brazil 60 years ago, must be periodically remembered and strongly deplored. This is what we have to do to diminish the likeness 
to repeat it. The public state University of Sao Paulo will never forget it. So on behalf of the University of Sao Paulo and of the organizing committee for the seminar Gig Economy, Social Rights, Technology Change and Labor Regulations, I wish you all a great provoking and stimulating seminar. For the ones who come from outside of Sao Paulo, please have you all a wonderful state and please don't hesitate to call us for anything you need. Thanks for coming and thanks for having me this morning. With no further delay, I will leave the floor to our great beloved friend and Deacon, Professor Liz Tippett. Welcome back to you know, University of Sao Paulo School of Law, Liz. So the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Professor Freitas. I'm so excited to be with you all. And I am so sad not to be there in person. Of course, I remember and recognize the wonderful um, room that you are in right now. <clears throat> um, and I, I wish I could be with all of our friends in Brazil. And I'm so grateful that my colleague, Mohamed Elian, is able to join in person and share some remarks as well. Um, thank you, Professor Freitas, for um, hosting this symposium. And it, it is always a true honor, a true honor to engage with you, a true honor to engage with the um, labor law colleagues in Brazil um, and to be at all involved with the University of Sao Paulo. It's a true pleasure. Um, and also, I wish to share my gratitude to Adriana Calvo, um, for those of you who don't know, Adriana Calvo was a visiting scholar here at the University of Oregon in the fall, and everyone absolutely loved her. We all miss her. She was in, she joined our employment law class and shared her perspectives. She met all of the judges and local lawyers. They loved her. And I think at this point, Adriana Calvo knows more lawyers and judges in Oregon than I do. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, we miss having her and it's nice to be, uh, to see her remotely. Um, I'm very excited to hear from the impressive speakers that Adriana and Professor Freitas have organized for, um, for you in the next few days. Um, I'm interested in hearing about the American justice system from Professor Cochran and from Mohammed Elian. Um, I thought I would give uh, the audience a little bit of background about uh, others of our American colleagues as well, in case you haven't interacted with them yet in the past. Um, Professor Catherine Fisk is a leading scholar in the area of labor law in the United States and also a wonderful legal historian. And um, she actually wrote a, a wonderful book on the history of intellectual property, which I recommend to everyone. It's called uh, Working Knowledge. Um, Professor Dubal, who you'll hear from, has also done really fascinating research on the gig economy. And I've read and cited a lot of her work. And I am very eager to hear about what she is working on right now. Um, Professor Duval, if you don't know, is also a little bit famous in the United States. Sometimes, you know, I'll just be driving in my car and, and there'll be an interview on the radio and you'll hear Professor Duval would pop up on the radio or you'll just be reading some article in the news and they'll be citing Professor Duval. So she always has a very cutting edge point of view to share. Um, and then, of course, Professor Estreicher, um, Everyone is so lucky to have Professor S. Stryker there in person. Um, he is a wonderful friend and co-author. Um, if you have not heard of Professor S. Stryker in the past, Professor S. Stryker was the chief reporter of the first and only restatement of employment law. Um, and the restatement is a, a like a 500 page book that summarizes the general principles of American employment law. It's a, it's a very authoritative document um, from 2015. Um, and this also means that Professor S. Stryker is a walking encyclopedia of American labor and employment law. So since you have him in person, there is no legal question in American employment law that Professor S. Stryker does not know the answer to. 
So I, <laughs> I encourage all of our Brazilian friends, you can quiz Professor Estreicher of any question at all in American employment law. I guarantee that he will know the answer off the top of his head. So it is absolutely wonderful that you have him there in person for you. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit today briefly um, uh, to give everyone a little bit of context for the uh, symposium ahead. Um, I don't have a lot to say, but I thought I would give you a little bit of background about the uh, American uh, law that applies in the context of the gig economy, uh, as well as some, some of my own thoughts about it and then share a little bit of my research that uh, it's actually older research that I think is a little bit relevant for um, some of the current context in Brazil around whether courts should simply defer to the contracts that workers <coughs> have entered into. I apologize, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold here. Um, one last point, which is that at this point, Adriana Calvo is probably the leading expert on comparing Brazilian and American law in the context of the gig economy. So um, she, she is probably the most authoritative person to explain how American law compares to Brazilian law. Um, I, my sense from a very limited understanding is that there are some respects in which American law is similar and some respects in which it's different. So I'll, I'll try to explain the American portion of it so that those of you in Brazil can assess whether it's similar or different from Brazil. Okay, and now I'm going to try and share my screen and we'll see how this works. I feel like this is a great time for me to make tech mistakes here. Uh, here we go. All right. Um, are you able to see my PowerPoint presentation? Okay, great. All right, I will get started then. Um, All right, so um, a couple of like basic background points about the American uh, law as applied to um, the labor and employment context. Constitutional law generally has very little to say about labor and employment law. Um, we don't really have guaranteed rights under the constitution that generally apply to all workers. Um, I don't know. It sounds like I, I gather that the 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 constitution in Brazil is a little bit broader, but American constitutional law has very little intersection unless um, you're talking about government workers, because um, a lot of the American constitution is actually limits what the government can can do, and so periodically government workers will invoke the constitution to say, well, my employer, the government, can't restrict my free speech, or my employer, the government can't um, engage in this search of my office. But that's that's mostly the extent of it. So um, Professor uh, Fisk is gonna talk a little bit about constitutional law, but uh, the thing to remember uh, and is constitutional law under the California constitution, that the law that she's gonna explain is not really about the substantive rights of workers, that it's mostly about whether the way that the gig worker law was passed complies with the California constitution. So it's more of a procedural issue. It's, it doesn't really invoke the substantive rights. Um, so in the American context, most worker rights are spelled out as a matter of uh, federal statute or a state statute. We, we also have a few common law rights. And again, I, I would direct you to Sam Estreicher, who is the extremely relevant on the common law rights. Um, for the, but for the most part, we're talking about statutes. And so um, that means that what we're talking about gig workers and what types of rights the gig workers have, it's mostly about whether those workers are covered by a particular federal or state statute. And usually that, and usually those statutes are crafted to cover employees um, as defined by the statute or employers as defined by the statute. Um, and um, in many cases, the statute doesn't really spell out what that means or they doesn't provide very much detail. And so courts are sort of left to apply these more common law tests to assess whether someone is covered by the statute. And so the way that those statutes have generally been interpreted is to mean that they will cover um, 
employees, but not independent contractors. And so there's sort of this general question as in Brazilian law of, is this worker, is this gig worker an independent contractor or are they employee? Um, that also doesn't mean that there's any rule that prohibits um, workers from being covered by a statute. Like they're, they're, you could have a statute that explicitly covers gig workers. There's no reason you couldn't do that. Um, and so Professor Fisk is gonna talk about a um, sp special law in California that was passed as part of an election um, as a ballot measure about that was specific to gig workers. So you could have legislation that provides protections for gig workers. You could also have legislation that says that gig workers qualify as employees for the purpose of a particular statute. Um, and there are like a few rare instances where that has taken place. So for example, during COVID-19, <clears throat> Congress, um, the United States government passed a law that provided um, various um, forms of, of, of extra payments and relief to individuals on the assumption that they were losing their jobs. And one of the things that that law did, which was temporary, was it said that um, if you are getting unemployment insurance um, and you lost your job and your job was gig work, you can get unemployment insurance for losing gig work, even though ordinarily gig work doesn't really count um, as employment. There was that Congress drafted the law to say gig work counts, right? So that's an example. Um, another example that you saw is uh, after the Me Too movement, there were um, some, some states decided to um, amend their harassment statutes, their anti-harassment statutes to include independent contractors, <coughs> which would <coughs> also cover gig workers, right? So it, it is possible to include them in statutes. It's just as a matter of typical practice, they're not covered in the statutes. Um, I wanted to share one other point of terminology, although um, American scholars don't always use these terms precisely. Um, you know, in American nomenclature, we often speak of labor and employment law, but as a, as a more technical matter, typically uh, the word labor law refers to the law of, of unions and collective bargaining and unionizing, um, typically under the National Labor Relations Act. Um, whereas employment law typically refers to the law that applies to everyone, to everyone regardless of whether they're unionized or not. So for example, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act or the workers' compensation law. Um, uh, so uh, the National Labor Relations Act uh, also is sort of presumed to cover employees and not independent contractors. Um, but that uh, depends a little bit uh, because the National Labor Relations Act um, is administered by a, a board and the people that comprise that board are political appointees. At which change over time. And so when a new president comes to power, they get to appoint some new people to the board. And though that person they appoint tends to share the political viewpoint. And so what you see is that when democratic administrations are in power, they tend to like to define employee very broadly, um, Republican appointees, not so much. Um, and so you do see the line between employee and independent contract character often shifts a little bit depending on who's in the White House when you're talking about labor law. Um, the other thing to know is that um, because the National Labor Relations Act doesn't cover independent contractors, it leaves a little bit of room for um, states or for municipalities potentially to regulate gig workers and to uh, uh, permit uh, gig workers to engage in potentially union activity and collective bargaining outside of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, and that is potentially an interesting source of experimentation and innovation at the local level. And I, I believe Professor Estreicher uh, might be talking about these sorts of questions um, and how they interact with antitrust law. Okay. Um, this is the quintessential problem that uh, gig workers face, but that, that we always that, that tends to arise when you're talking about independent contractors, which even though um, 
there's no like in, in American law, there's no one rule that decides whether you're an employee or independent contractor. It's each statute. You're either covered by each statute, um, depending on whatever rule applies to that statute. Um, generally speaking, if you're a company and you have a worker, you decide whether that person's going to be treated as an employee or an independent contractor. So it's really just one choice, even though there are many laws that apply. Um, and maybe you're misclassifying them and they're supposed to be employees, but you're treating them as independent contractors and you have li liability for that. But one consequence of drafting all of our labor and employment laws around providing protections for employees is that it means employees get all the protections and independent contractors, at least historically, have gotten nothing. Um, so um, this is a little bit of an oversimplification and many scholars have talked about this, which is that, um, you know, there are actually many employees who don't really have great protections under labor and employment laws. Um, because like maybe they work for a company that doesn't have very much money. And if you sue them, you won't get anything out of them. So those companies don't really comply with labor and employment laws. <coughs> or you might be an hourly employee or a temporary employee who hasn't been working somewhere for very long and they don't give you very many hours and you don't make enough money to make a living. And because you're working part-time, you don't really get benefits and you don't get health care, and the hours are very unpredictable and you, you can't really cobble uh, together enough hours to um, support yourself and your family and you don't really get enough sick leave. Um, so like for those folks, you know, the umbrella they're holding, even though they're employees has a lot of holes in it, right? The other thing to know about um, the situation in American law is that some people have also like really, really nice umbrellas. So uh, like, for example, under American law, like there are very few um, benefits that are required as a matter of law, for example, uh, vacation. There's no lo law in the United States that requires vacation time. Um, the laws that provide for sick leave in um, under American law are very limited. Um, you on, on, you're only required to get a little bit of sick leave. Um, and then the, the laws around um, leave for family medical leave are very limited, right? So that's the baseline of a bit, um, law. So like the, the, the type of umbrella that you're entitled to as a matter of law as an employee is not that great. Uh, but what actually happens as a practical matter is like many of the highly compensated employees who are more valued by employers, those workers actually get like very generous leave. They get very generous vacation. They get very generous sick time. They get uh, leave beyond what the law requires. And so like they have really fancy robust protections by their companies but that's because the companies are not required to provide that they pro they provide it sort of as a matter of largesse to retain the employees they want um and then those employees are don't end up being as worried about what the legal protections are because they already get very generous protections so like this that that's why this picture is kind of an oversimplification um but the other side to this story is like the reason that we're talking about gig work and the reason why um, gig work is attractive is not just um, because like these companies make a lot of money and they have an unfair competitive advantage over other companies that um, comply with the law, but also that this type of work is attractive to some workers because those workers already have kind of a raw deal um, when you're talking about employment status. And so gig work seems in some contexts comparatively attractive. Um, the, other, the other reason that workers are pushed towards gig work is because they might have a, an employment status with one company, but their hours are very, very unpredictable um, because their company is using scheduling software that schedules them at the very last minute or that schedules them uh, for inconsistent times and shifts and not really enough work. And, but because they don't know what their shift is going to be, they can't get a second job because they can't reliably be at that job at a specific time. And so one of the reasons why the gig work ended up being attractive is because it allows these workers with unpredictable schedules to fill up the time in the schedule that's unpredictable. Um, 
you know, and I think also like the story about gig workers also in the United States is like complex. And Vina Dubal has done some really interesting research around this. And again, I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Um, but like, yes, these workers resent the control that they, um, that are imposed by the algorithm and that the algorithm will send them all these places that are not too favorable. But, um, you know, it's also true that these workers also choose gig work because they like some aspects of the flexibility. So um, Vina Duval interviewed one uh, gig work uh, driver for a ride sharing service who said, you know, the reason I like this work is because I, if I want to take my son fishing on a weekday uh, after school, I can do that. And I couldn't do that with a regular job. So, you know, I think it's important to think about the choices that the companies are making, but also the choices that workers are making and to enable them to be able to make the choices that they want to make about what kind of work they want to perform. Um, you know, there's also like a broader systemic question when we're talking about um, <coughs> the American system. And I talk about this a lot in my forthcoming book, which I've been working on for way too long. But, um, you know, I, I think it's worth questioning the design of the American system where we're where all of us as workers, but also the government is extremely reliant in the United States on companies to provide basic social welfare benefits. Um, the government benefits from this because they don't have to use tax dollars to provide basic social welfare benefits. But the consequence of it is that it channels workers towards employment status and away from other forms of work that might not be employment status, that might give them more freedom, or that might enable you to be a caregiver for someone, or that might enable you to start your own business. And in the United States, the big story about um, why people are driven towards employment status um, is healthcare, right? And I think I think the American healthcare system is, as everyone knows, is privatized. And the vast majority of people in the United States that are working age are reliant on employers to obtain health insurance. And when you lose a job, you no longer have health insurance. Um, and so that pushes workers towards <laughs> employment status. Um, Conversely, because um, healthcare is so, so expensive in the United States, it also means that <coughs> companies that misclassify workers as independent contractors and gig companies in particular um, have a strong competitive advantage over other companies by not providing those sorts of benefits. <coughs> there is also sort of a racialized component to this, a historical racialized component to this general idea in the American economy, in the American culture, that you need to work and have, be, submit yourself to an employer and be an employee in order to be worthy of benefits, um, and that you need to work in order to have health care or any other kind of basic necessities of living. So um, this is something that is not always said out loud, but it's, it's very present in American culture. So for example, there was an interview yesterday on National Public Radio um, with um, a, some uh, leaders in Alabama, leaders and commentators in Alabama, which is a state that has refused to expand Obamacare to um, uh, people in that state. So um, Obamacare would enable more people in Alabama to get Medicaid, which is government provided um, health care for poorer Americans, many of whom work but have no access to health care for various reasons. And in Alabama, they have refused to make this, these health care services available to poor Americans. And the underlying narrative that is often not said out loud is that, is that you should be forced to work in order to get health care. Um, and in fact, in this interview yesterday, this, this policy expert who's on a right-leaning think tank said out loud that this was his point of view. So he said, like, the reason we don't want to expand Medicaid is if you open up this program to hundreds of thousands of people, because it would affect, you know, more than 100,000 people in that state, then it will hurt the labor participation rate and give people a reason not to work and to stay at home, right? So the idea is that you have, you know, 
you have to you force people into work and that healthcare should be something that you're that is a that is only available to you if you go to work um so i'm kind of jumping the gun here and talking about um policy uh policy outcomes sort of within the first five minutes of this symposium, but I think it's worth thinking about um, as we sort of bridge the gap between people um, with umbrellas and without umbrellas, um, what would that look like? The answer might be something like healthcare. So there, there's not such a big difference between what it means to be an employee and what it means to be an independent contractor. Um, and Obamacare, the 2010 Affordable Care Act, which is not typically thought of as an employment statute, um, actually made a di big difference in that regard. Because what Obamacare did was it expanded Medicaid, which is for for poor, uh, low income working Americans, expanded Medicaid, it imposed minimum standards on health insurance, but it also made it possible to buy, to purchase work and health insurance on your own. Um, so that you didn't have to have a job in order to get health insurance. And it subsidized those purchases of health insurance on your own. Um, so it just made it easier to get healthcare. Again, I mean, it wasn't totally transformative of this whole landscape of tying healthcare benefits to work because um, health insurance is still really expensive and the subsidies phase out pretty quickly. But it made a difference in terms of whether it would even be possible for you to work independently. And in fact, the there is um, at least those in the gig economy fully admit that Obamacare would actually ushered in to some extent the gig economy um, in the American economy. So um, Mark Andreessen, who's a very famous um, venture capitalist, said that Obamacare was the biggest enabler of the gig economy. And um, the founder of Uber also said that um, Obamacare was really important for their business. Um, of course, this this particular quote of his didn't age very well when he's like, oh, well, people don't have to work for the man <laughs> in order for health care. Well, you know, I think now that we're more than 10 years into the gig economy, I, I think we, you know, Uber starts to look a lot like the man. But, you know, at the time he was trying to claim that you were engaged in active resistance by working for Uber. OK. I also wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, the test that is used to assess whether someone's an employee or an independent contractor. Um, there's more than one test. This is one of the main tests. Um, my understanding is that in Brazil, there's a question about whether um, the contract itself will be determinative of whether someone uh, qualifies as an employee or an independent contractor. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about um, the American rules that apply. This is the common law. Uh, rule that applies in the absence of any other rules. <laughs> this is very familiar to all of our American colleagues. Um, how, so this, this test is about how much control the employer has over the worker. So how highly skilled are they? Who provides the tools? Is the location on the employer's work site? How long does the uh, relationship last, whether the worker can assign, like subcontract their work to other people is how, whether it's paid in like a lump sum versus like an hourly basis, um, whether it's part of the regular business of the company, um, stuff like that. So notably the, whether the contract says that the person's an independent contractor or an employee is not part of this test. Sometimes courts do consider what the contract says, but when they do consider it, it's like a very minor part of it because it's understood that employers have a strong incentive to um, game the system and to write things that are not true in their contracts. And um, over time, courts have come to believe that they don't want employers to game the system and they want to um, you know, sort of avoid and detect uh, when an employer is engaged in a subterfuge, when they're like trying to create the appearance of, of a contractor relationship when in fact it's an employment relationship. This is another test that is also sometimes used to assess whether someone's an employee versus an independent contractor. Um, it's somewhat similar, but it's mostly about whether the worker is economically dependent on the company um, for the work. 
Um, so it's not just whether you own the tools to do the work, but like how much investment is required to do the work. Like whether your uh, the profit or loss that you obtain from your business is from your managerial skill or just from doing more work. Um, so this is basically trying to detect whether you as the worker have an independent business. So like to go back to uh, what Professor Freitas was saying at the very beginning of the lecture, um, you know, whether we think these folks who are delivering pizza are like the quintessential entrepreneur that are like investing in their own business and they're making profit from their managerial skill or whether they're just making essentially wages from doing more work, making more deliveries. Here too, um, the what the contract says is not like a part of this test. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about like the sort of empirical question of do companies try to game the system um, by loading up their contracts with terms that try to favor them on these tests. Um, and try to like essentially persuade courts that might be reviewing the contract um, to think this person is a bona fide contractor, or maybe also maybe they're trying to to persuade the the worker that they're an independent contractor and discourage them from suing. So this is actually like kind of an older study I did ten years ago where I gathered um, ter uh, terms of use contracts from gig economy companies as well as comparator com com companies that were like not gig companies. Um, and I was trying to look at whether um, companies that are have likely uh, misclassified their independent contractors, especially gig companies, were more likely to add terms to their contractor contract that said, oh, by the way, you're an independent contractor, you're not our employee, like we don't exercise control over you. Like, are they loading up their contracts with all these terms because they're worried you'll be misclassified? And also this sort of a sneaky question of whether you could detect whether this company is misclassifying its workers by the prevalence of terms in the contract that are like full of disclaimers saying that you're a contractor and not an employee. So here's some, so here's some examples of the different types of contra contract terms that we're trying to like basically like game the system on whether you're a contractor or an employee. So one of the ways that that um, gig companies did this, not entirely successfully, by was by saying, "Oh, we're a platform. We're not an employer. We're not like a taxi company. We're just a platform that match riders and drivers." There, there's com like another really common term in gig economy companies where like, "Oh, you're just not an employee. You're an independent contractor." <laughs> And then other terms that were basically trying to help on other factors of the test, like saying, well, you provide your own insurance, you need to pay your own taxes, you're not eligible for unemployment insurance, we're not even a party to this contract, this is just between you and the person you're driving around, um, you're not going to receive benefits, you're going to bring your own tools, you set your own schedule, all these things where like if this case ever came up before a court, they could say, look at all, look at all these provisions in our contract that show this person exercises uh, control over their own lives and we don't exercise control over them. Now, a lot of this is like fluff, right? Because you could put in a contract, we don't exercise control of you. That doesn't actually mean they don't exercise control of you. That's just what the contract says. It's, there's like a fictional element to this that might just be like lawyers trying to tilt the scales in their client's favor because they're worried about misclassification risk. So uh, the thing, one of the things that I did was I had some research assistants look at the websites for all these gig companies and do a little bit of research. <laughs> and then I had them assess how much skill they thought was required to do that job um, and all these other factors that are used um, to assess whether someone's an independent contractor or not. Um, they didn't always agree on what their rating was, I think because there was like a variety of information available on the internet, sometimes very limited. But what I was trying to do by having them do this research was ass assign a score to each of these companies for how much control they exercise over their workers so that we could later compare this metrics for how much control they exercise with how many provisions were in their contract to see if the ones that exercise the most control actually have the most disclaimers in their contract. 
So here's how, here's like some of the companies that I estimated. Again, this, this study is very old. So I was using like this sort of language that is not the language we use now. So I was looking at like um, gig companies that are only sharing property, like sharing your car, sharing your tools, sharing your house, like Airbnb. These I sort of put in a low risk category of they don't exercise a lot of control because you're just sharing property. And in fact, when we looked at the score, the control scores that were assigned by the RAs um, for these property sharing companies, they were for the most part not exercising very much control over workers. So like, you know, five of the companies I looked at had almost, you know, very low amounts of control. And there was this like middle category of property-based services where the gig worker was combining their property with their labor to sell the service. So like, this is where you see the Lyft and Uber and similar type companies, like some of these have gone out of business, um, but also like a dog boarding company. Um, and you can see that those companies exercise varying degrees of control over their workers. Some of them, um, as rated by my RAs, like exercise pretty high degrees of control over their workers, which like we now know, now that these companies are all familiar to us, this should not be surprising to us. I mean, at the time we were trying to do an objective measure. And then I also included more legacy companies, a few of them, to try to give a baseline for what high levels of control meant. So like FedEx, UPS, and taxi companies. Um, and so you can see um, they exercise levels of control that are pretty similar to some of these ride sharing apps. And also I took into account whether they treated their workers, employees, or independent contractors. So UPS actually treats their workers as employees. And you can see they exercise a level of control that my RE has estimated around like a score of five. That's like at least an A cut point for where you know, at least one company would treat those workers and as employees. And like there's one gig company that exercised levels of control that exceeded that. So if you were using the same metric, you would say these people probably misclassified. Maybe these folks as well, right? I mean, certainly there's been a lot of litigation for FedEx, a lot of lit litigation for taxi companies about whether they're misclassifying their workers. So these folks might have been misclassified. And that also suggests maybe these folks, these companies are misclassifying workers. Maybe not so much, though, these property sharing companies. I also looked at um, other types of sharing services, again, like very older nomenclature, where it's just labor. So these are basically like temp, like um, services online. <laughs> some of these are familiar, some of them have gone out of business. Amazon MTurk, obviously still around. 99design was like a graphic design thing. It's just like online labor, task rabbit. I think they were acquired by Ikea or something. And then I compared them to temp, temp agencies and like listing services. They're really just matching services um, between um, workers and um, people that are looking for work. So um, here too, you can see temp agencies, like not surprisingly, pretty much the ones I looked at all treated their workers as employees. These service sharing platforms uh, exercised actually widely varying levels of control over their workers. And some of them, many of them actually not very much and quite a bit less than temp agencies. Um, and, and where some of these companies were pretty similar to listing services. So I think there was like no definitive answer to how much control these companies were exercising over workers. You know, I think this research also gives the picture that um, gig companies are not all the same, right? And some of them are very employee-like and some of them are not. All right, so then we get to sort of the main question of this research, which is whether these companies are trying to gain the system by jamming their contracts full of disclaimers about how you're not an employee, you're an independent contractor. So I assigned like a litigation risk score to each of the types of companies that I was talking about earlier. And the way I did that was I used the control score, but if the company classified their workers as employees, uh, oops, I don't know what the balloons are. I think that's some sort of new AI gesture-based thing. Um, if the if the company classified their employee their workers as employees, they got a litigation risk score of zero. So temp agencies here they have no litigation risk because they they just have employees. So, um, and then I counted the number of provisions in the standard form contract that had the sorts of disclaimers we talked about earlier, like the number of provisions like this one with various denials about independent contractor status. And it turns out the companies that had the highest litigation risk score 
that is a, like exercised a lot of control and then classified people as independent contractors, those companies were the ones that had the most provisions in their contracts saying you were not an employee, you're an independent contractor. All of which suggests that like, you know, contracts are really not a reliable estimate about what's going on in the employment relationship, except like in the sense that they're the reverse, which is the more that you're the more that your contract insists that you're an independent contractor, the more actually there's a potential likelihood that you're misclassified. They're like protesting too much that you're an independent contractor rather than an employee. So um, I also developed this little thing called the misclassification fear index. And this is just a list of how many provisions do you have in your contract that talk about how you're not an employee, you're an independent contractor, you provide your own benefits, all this stuff, how like just counting up all the provisions in your contract, you know, you can see that the companies that have like the most of these types of provisions probably are also might potentially be the worst actors. Although you can see there's actually quite a big difference at this time, you know, again, this is 10 years ago between Uber and Lyft down here, you know, they're pretty equivalent, right? TaskRabbit, had like a huge number of provisions like this. Um, the reason for my American colleagues, the reason why TaskRabbit actually, you never saw their name in litigation is because um, they had an arbitration provision in their um, gig worker agreement <laughs> before anyone else did. The other, some of the other companies were sort of later to the game. And so that's why they managed to avoid litigation while Uber and Lyft didn't because Uber and Lyft added their arbitration provision later on but anyways this gives you a sense of like these companies are just like loading up their contracts with provisions intended to mitigate their liability um and that you really can't trust what a company says in a con in a contract um to at least to uncover the true nature of their relationship with their workers i think that's all i have for today um Thank you very much for your time and engagement. And I invite people to contact me over email anytime if they would like to chat about anything. Thank you, Professor Lees. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. We're going to go straight to the next session. Okay. Thank you very much again, Professor Lees. Well, it goes. Going straight to the next one. I'm going to leave the floor to uh, share Professor Olivia Paspaletti. Please come to come start to the table. our next session of Introduction to American Judicial System. And to preside the session, we invite the PhD and Master Specialist in Labor Law and Social Security by Universidade de São Paulo, graduated in law by Universidade de São Paulo in Ribeirão Preto. PhD and researcher by the Hayashi Sasakawa Young Leaders Fellowship Fund, professor and researcher of labor and social security law of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Please welcome Mrs. Olivia de Quintana Pascualeto. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you, all the organizers, Professor Freitas, Professor Elizabeth Tippett, and Professor Adena Calvo for organizing this remarkable event. And also, I would like to thank you uh, also for inviting me to be here moderating this panel with these great specialists on the topic. So I would like to invite to join me here um, Professor August Bonner Cochran and Professor Mohamed Elian, and also Professor Juan Henda Leal Fernandes, please. Thank you. So uh, this is our first, first session called Introduction to American Judicial System. And I, I need to confess that I am excited to hear from you about this topic because here in Brazil, 
uh, maybe generally speaking, it's common to refer to the American law and maybe uh, to think about the American system as a possible inspiration. So I think this session is necessary to understand more and better uh, the differences and also the particularities of your system and also to avoid simplistic conclusions. So I'm really excited to hear from you. So uh, today uh, we, we will start with Professor August Cochran and uh, Professor Cochran is Emeritus Professor of, uh, of Political Science at Agnes Scott College. He's also a um, Juris Doctor from Georgia State University, VCG Professor in the Graduate Program in Law at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, his speech today is about a, a U.S. Supreme Court era locker returns. Thank you, Professor Cochran. Sorry for bothering us. We're trying to find out where's the, just a minute, please. <laughs> The presentation. The presentation. Yeah. Mm. Uh, technology. Gig. Yeah. We are talking about technology and fighting every time. Technology. <laughs> <laughs> no, and this is another one we we're trying to see. This one. Gig. Gig. Oh, this one. This one. Okay. Yes. I think we got it. Oh, presentation mode. Here. Uh, so, well, <laughs> and to advance, take some time, but we we can achieve it. How do I advance the slides? Yes. Uh, okay, let me see if it's working. Uh, uh, it's not. Yes. It's not shared. Uh, is it possible to share? Uh, yeah. I'm sure. As they told me, it should be shared. Okay, but let me see. Maybe there. They ask me so emphatically, don't, don't, no, touch don't this. Touch <laughs> anything. Because this, this is a, 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 a screaming for the YouTube, you know? Mm. Let me see. Mm. Well, anyway, if it, if it doesn't work, you just uh, no. your presentation and we're going to share the, the PowerPoint. Just 10 minutes. Yes. I think this is what work here. I think she's better than me. Is this there we go. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. You got it. Okay. You got it, Olivia? Okay. So the floor is. Is yours. Thank you, Professor Olivia, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, Professor Freitas and Professor Calvo for your kind and generous invitation to participate in this seminar. It's so topical and so interesting. Um, it's a great honor to be here and also a great pleasure. Normalmente, quando eu faço palestras no Brasil, eu tento falar em português. E eu sempre tenho que começar com uh, agradecendo uh, a plateia para sua paciência com o meu português. Porque o idioma uh, português é muito lindo, mas o meu português é muito feio. Uh, eu... Comencei a aprender um pouco de português quando eu estava um aluno de intercâmbio em Itu, Itu. Uh, mas este foi antes de tudo ficar grande em Itu. Foi em uh, o ano de 1963. Aliás, parece que eu cheguei no Brasil antes de vocês. Uh, Ok. Esta é a minha faculdade na Atlanta. Eu sou de Atlanta, Georgia, capital de Georgia, uh, estado ao lado de Alabama, onde nós também temos esse problema de não estacar Obamacare, porque o estado político de Georgia é muito conservador. E uh, é, é no sul dos Estados Unidos, e no do sul, em especial, eu, como idoso, tenho um sotaque bem encorregado uh, 
uh, e bem diferente de outras regiões do país. Então, eu acho que se vocês acham meu português um pouco estranho, quando eu falo inglês, vocês também vão achar meu inglês esquisito. Mas é, talvez é, seria interessante para vocês comparar meu sotaque, meu sotaque com o sotaque de outros palestrantes. Ok, vamos lá, em inglês. Uh, it is a great honor to be here on the first panel, but also a little intimidating because I'm not a law professor. I'm a political scientist at an undergrad college rather than a law school, which you probably know is two separate institutions uh, in the United States. And so I thought a long time about what can I contribute that would complement uh, these more learned law professors who know much more in much more depth about the legal questions uh, involved in this seminar. And so I decided to take a chance and be political and maybe uh, polemical as well as political because to a political scientist, everything is political and most things are polemical. Uh, so I also thought this might be a kind of uh, useful agenda setting technique, though, for an early speaker in a conference, because uh, to talk about politics uh, may give uh, an idea of a larger context for the legal questions that we'll be considering. Um, and that might be especially useful for our Brazilian colleagues. And it also, I think probably politics has few answers and many questions. We used to say political science has many approaches, but few arrivals. Um, it might be uh, useful to just raise questions that maybe the conference will be able to answer more definitively as we go, or maybe not, maybe they'll remain open. Um, I'm sure you probably are picking up in the media that 2024 is a very troubled political time in the United States. Uh, we're going to have an election for president of the United States this November. And um, there are surveys that show that 75% of Americans do not want Donald Trump to be a candidate. There are also surveys that show 75% of Americans do not want Joe Biden to be a candidate. And so who are our candidates? Trump versus Biden says a lot of uh, negative things, I think, about our political system. But interestingly, too, the Supreme Court uh, is going to issue some decisions in June that may intensify a situation that is already very intense and very polarized and very controversial. We'll see, of course, but um, they have, uh, in recent years, uh, the Supreme Court has been, I was gonna say dragged into the political arena. I, I'm not sure they've been dragged. They've entered uh, voluntarily the political arena with a number of very controversial questions and uh, decisions. And uh, so I think that trend might continue. So I can't unravel this whole mess, uh, bagunza, uh, in one lecture. Uh, I don't think I could do it in a book. I'm not sure a library can do it. But I thought we could uh, say a few preliminary things that might be uh, useful, and one hint as to uh, understanding the situation today is uh, a historical famous uh, law case that I couldn't help thinking of as Professor Tippett was talking about contracts because it's all about labor contracts, and I'm referring to Lochner versus New York, of course, and uh, this is a case that is almost 100 years old, but well, actually maybe it's more than 100 years old. Yes, more than 100, 115 years old. And uh, But it's not just of historical interest. It is historically interesting, not just for 1905 when it was decided, but ever since it's a 
sort of lens through which you can measure or trace the development of American constitutional jurisprudence. But I also think it has a lot to say about the contemporary situation. So Lochner is known to all American law students as anti-canon. It's one of those horrible decisions like Dred Scott or like Plessy v. Ferguson that law students learn, don't do that, don't uh, make decisions like this. Um, but one thing I have discovered is I looked into it more that uh, the view of Lochner has changed and is changing still. Uh, in American law, and therefore, I think in some ways, uh, may or may not be a kind of predictor of the future. Uh, we skipped one, I think. No? Oh, geez. Let me see something. Ah, well, we skipped a couple of slides. I'm not sure. Let me just say that I... Um, began to learn more about Lochner when disembargador Luis uh, Eduardo Gunter in uh, TRT Nova, Novi uh, in Curitiba uh, had the idea to invite me to write a small book. He has a series, a collection of great decisions in history, uh, great judgments, and his idea was, since I'm an American, I should write about Lochner. This was not my first choice, and I sort of resisted. But it turns out this is probably the best idea that I ever had. I'm really glad he forced me to make this uh, choice because it turns out to be such an interesting uh, case. So... Uh, I'm not sure why I'm missing some slides. I had a picture of a bakery. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing some slides here. But uh, a, a bakery in Atlanta that's a Brazilian bakery. And it represents the image of bakeries, right? Because we think of bakeries as being beautiful, uh, smelling wonderful, tasting uh, so delicious. But the reality of bakers bakeries in 1905, in the late 19th century also, is totally different, at least in New York, because many of the bakeries in New York City were in the basements of tenements. Tenements are cortizos, I think, more or less. And uh, the reality was they had little sunshine, they had terrible air, uh, the pipes from upstairs leaked, and so it was very foul atmosphere, very uh, terrible. And the bakers themselves had had to work very long hours. At times, at times, eighteen hours. Sometimes they even slept in the bakeries. So New York passed a reform called the Bake Shop Act that limited the hours of bakers to only 10 hours a day, uh, 60 hours a week. But a baker in Utica, New York, uh, objected to this law, and so he sued, and the case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is the Supreme Court. Uh, we often say the Supreme Court is nine old men. This was literally true in 1905. And the majority opinion of the Supreme Court was that this law uh, reform was unconstitutional. Why? Principally because they thought it infringed on the freedom of contract, the liberty of contract, not just of the employer, but of the employee who might want to work 18 hours a day necessary to make enough money. Uh, they recognized, oh, incidentally, that uh, liberty of contract is not explicit in the Constitution of the United States, but it comes from an earlier decision by this same sort of very conservative court uh, just a few years earlier. They recognized that the law, the right of liberty of contract is not absolute, but they uh, argued that the state 
exercising what we call police powers, the power to regulate for the benefit of the community for health, safety, welfare, or even morals of the community, they thought this exercise was not reasonable. Why? They thought limiting the number of hours didn't have anything to do with health, either of the public or of the workers. And they thought that it didn't wasn't necessary to protect the welfare of the workers who they said, after all, are adults. They have the freedom to enter a contract or not enter a contract. Uh, and so what they thought actually was that this was class legislation. By that, they meant legislation uh, advantaging uh, one of the parties of the contract, namely the workers or even the unions. Uh, I think they had an older 19th century idea of Jacksonian, Andrew Jackson's idea of liberty, equal rights for all, special rights for none. And so it's a more formalistic sort of notion of equality. Justice Harlan uh, wrote a dissent. This decision was five to four, incidentally, a very close decision. And Harlan wrote a dissent that three people signed on to, and it's a very lengthy and very intelligent uh, dissent. It mainly argues that it was a reasonable exercise of police power, and he amasses a lot of facts and a lot of statistics. But the dissent that garnered most attention, my friend John Renda likes to point out, it was only three paragraphs. Maybe we academics could take a lesson from his brevity. Um, and uh, it made really two points. One is he said the justices were exercising not judicial function, but they were in effect legislating. They were overruling the legislative judgment of the legislature of the state of New York. In other words, judicial activism. Um, and then second, he said, they're reading into the Constitution their economic ideology. They are reading into the Constitution uh, substantive do, using substantive due right, uh, due process, uh, rights that aren't explicitly there and aren't necessary uh, for constitutional litigation and constitutional principles. It's their political opinions. And he ended with this famous quotation, basically saying, the judges are trying to enact uh, social Darwinism, uh, Herbert Spencer's famous book. Uh, so some philosophers, uh, uh, law professors, have argued that the ideology behind uh, the Lochner decision is sort of twofold. One is there's an assumption that there's a prior existing uh, private order, social economic order, I think of Locke and the state of nature that exists before the state exists, before the social contract, and that this is natural and that it's also free. There's no coercion. People are entering contracts just because it's their benefit uh, to do so, and everyone's equal in their right to enter into contracts. So it's a condition of or hypothesis of uh, freedom, and that legislation is an imposition, an interference, as we Americans often say, in this market, in this social economic order. And so uh, the New York Bake Shop Act interfered and coerced people as to whether they could enter contracts or not. The decision wasn't all that controversial immediately. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Republican of a different sort of Republicanism, uh, made it controversial when he ran for president in 2000, uh, sorry, 1912. Uh, but over the years, it became very controversial, and the progressives of that era uh, made a lot of criticisms, I'll let you read them, but judicial activism, that they're enacting their uh, ideology, that it's purely formalistic, that they're not looking at the real situation of the bakers and the bake shops, uh, that they were using outdated ideas from the last century. Uh, and they argued that it was really very uh, political decision that they were favoring the rich 
capitalists, the oligarchs, the plutocrats of that era, uh, so that it was a, a bias toward the elite. But I should say, in fairness, that revisionist historians have argued that uh, this epic, I, I want to say, I forgot to say that um, the Lochner decision became a symbol for a whole epoch of Supreme Court jurisprudence, basically from 1895 until 1937. And revisionist historians have sort of criticized this idea that there's a whole epoch because the uh, balance on the Supreme Court between very conservatives and more progressives like Louis uh, Brandeis was very close. And so there are a lot of very conservative opinions from that era, but there are also some progressive uh, decisions too. But on the whole, I think most historians do think it's a conservative era. And when it really became uh, very controversial and very relevant was during the Great Depression. And here we have Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was elected in 1932 to be president starting in 19... I'm skipping. I, I don't understand. I'm missing some... Okay, so I'm missing some slides. I apologize. I don't can stop it. Um, what happened is Roosevelt was elected and, of course, began to enact uh, major legislation the first hundred days. They passed all sorts of really transformative sort of or uh, major legislation. But the Supreme Court of that era also uh, tended to be divided 5-4 and dominated by five conservatives who were hostile to the New Deal legislation. And so in about 1935, several decisions came down, striking down some of the pillars of the New Deal, the Agricultural Act, the uh, National Industrial uh, Recovery Act, and there was some threat that the Supreme Court was going to strike the newly passed National Labor Relations Act that uh, Professor Tippett referred to, and also the Social Security Act, uh, which would have been devastating to the New Deal. So uh, in 1936, Roosevelt was reelected overwhelmingly, uh, with an overwhelmingly, just shockingly unbalanced Democratic Congress. And so Roosevelt came up with this idea to uh, have a, well, it became known pejoratively as the court packing plan. His idea was that the, the, most uh, number of these justices, in fact, six out of nine were over 70 years old. So he put in, he proposed a plan that if you're over 70 on the court, you could retire with full benefits. And if you didn't retire, the president could appoint an additional justice. Most Americans think the number of justices is fixed by the Constitution, but it turns out that's not true. And it's varied historically between five and 10. But it had been at nine by tradition since the 1860s. And so this plan was not very popular. It was seen as a power grab by the president. And it wasn't the Republicans. It was the Democrats in Congress who uh, thought this is not a good plan. And they just procrastinated. They do what our Congress does best, which is nothing. They just sort of sat and let it die in committee, uh, basically. But it had a major effect. So Roosevelt lost on the surface. But underneath, uh, it tended to uh, change the views of the Supreme Court. And one judge switched his opinion. Again, revisionists sometimes say he was already in the process of changing his, his mind, but I can't help but think this helped him. And one retired, and then it became a New Deal court. And the dominant idea of the New Deal court at first was judicial restraint. Uh, deference to the legislature. In other words, the opposite of what the Lochner court had done because they wanted to let the president and the legislature enact legislation to get the country out of the depression. But this creates a kind of dilemma if you think about it, because if the court is just going to defer to the legislature, who's going to protect constitutional rights um, and so 
shortly after the court packing, uh, beginning though, when Roosevelt's began to have some control over the court, the Supreme Court uh, had a case called Caroline Products. And it's an interesting case because it, it, it dealt with nothing important, just uh, regulation of milk. Uh, but the court said, in its opinion, we're not going to decide whether this is a good regulation of milk or not. Uh, we're going to leave all these economic questions to the legislature. And if you don't like the decisions that the legislature is making, then you use your political rights. Uh, you can campaign, you can run for office, you can give money, you can vote, and you can change policy that way. Policy change is not for the courts. But it added a footnote, a very famous footnote in American constitutional law, footnote four, and said, there's some situations, if you think about it, they're all situations where politics doesn't work so well. Uh, there are certain fundamental rights, like the right to speech. You can't campaign if you don't have the right to free speech. So we'll protect these fundamental rights. Also, sometimes there are laws that infringe or distort political, democratic political processes. If the legislature is uh, making laws, uh, denying people the right to vote or uh, gerrymandering districts or things like that, the court is not gonna allow that because it wants the political processes to work. Also, there's certain uh, distinct and insulated minorities who are in effect, as Lonnie Grenier called them, uh, permanent minorities. If uh, states like, unfortunately mine, are so prejudiced uh, uh, racially that they deny African-Americans the right to vote, or even if they have the right to vote and run for office, white voters will not ever consider the merits of a black candidate. Um, this is also something that maybe the court needs to deal with because the majoritarian political process isn't sufficient. So this is sort of what uh, evolved into uh, what some people call legal liberalism, the sort of dominant jurisprudence of the post-World War epoch, basically, well, more or less until today, but changing now, uh, that allows a larger, more active, more reformist kind of uh, federal government. Uh, it understands federalism to uh, be uh, based on a very broad interpretation of our commerce clause so that the federal government can get involved in legislating about many activities that in the 19th century it couldn't and wouldn't. Uh, separation of powers that Congress can make fairly broad uh, delegations of authority and create administrative agencies to solve the problems of modern society. Economic rights, they're not going to uh, determine that so much. We'll leave that to politics. Uh, but they got involved in uh, ending racial segregation, at least as a legal practice. Uh, they began to incorporate some of the Bill of Rights uh, that, uh, well, they didn't start, but they uh, accelerated uh, treating those as uh, national rights and rights that limit the states as well as the national government. And even the probably the, one of the most uh, controversial decisions, of course, even uh, expanded a right that's not explicit in our Constitution to privacy that included in the Roe v. Wade decision the right to decide whether or not to end a uh, pregnancy. But beginning, this is sort of the dominant paradigm, beginning in the era of Ronald Reagan, maybe beginning before, but accelerating with the political movement uh, to conservatism, uh, there also began within the legal profession a uh, conservative movement. I, I'm glad some of my slides are working because I will leave some names with you in case you want to follow up some of the uh, books, but Steve Tallis, for instance, has a really excellent book, but also Amanda hollis Bursky, uh, uh about the strategy that conservatives, uh, professional lawyers um, used to uh, challenge this dominant legal paradigm. And um, 
It's very interesting because I think at first they thought, oh, we just need to appoint different judges because in our system, as you know, judges in effect make law uh, they, in the process of interpreting common law, but also the way they deal with statutes and uh, constitutional law, et cetera. And they, they were very disappointed with many of the judicial appointments of Nixon, for instance, and Ford. Even Ronald Reagan's appointments were mixed in terms of how they felt. And so they began to decide, we need to go deeper. We need to change the very culture of the legal profession. And they began to establish think tanks and chairs and the law and economics movement became very big in law schools, et cetera. And it's also interesting that not just strategy changed, but some of the substantive ideas began to change. So the older conservatives after the uh, New Deal court packing era um, tended to agree with liberals that Lochner was a terrible decision because they opposed judicial activism, now activism by liberals and uh, for example, they were very critical of the Roe v. Wade decision as saying that substantive due process because there is no right to an abortion in the Constitution. So the judges are being activists and, in essence, legislative. So this is the old conservatives basically accepted the progressive criticism of Lochner and used it against the liberals saying, oh, but you're doing the same thing. But with this legal, uh, new uh, legal conservative movement, there began to be a new type of conservative that began to question maybe Lochner was right. They began to question some of the historical facts about Lochner, but they also changed some of the values to, in some ways, go back to an older view. Uh, they began to think, well, the Constitution does protect economic rights, especially property rights, and again, Lochner itself, contract rights. And it, the Constitution does limit the activities and scope of the national government. Federalism should be more like it was in the 19th century, and we should have a more minimal government. And most interesting is some of them even begin to explicitly defend judicial activism because they think, ah, judges must protect these rights and this vision against popular government if we're losing uh and the losing elections and the government is passing legislations well then we need to stop that so this movement has had a great deal of success and this is our current uh court no longer nine old men thank goodness, but um, it's uh, a court that you're tempted to call a Trump court. Maybe I shouldn't, but uh, it has three Trump appointees uh, combined with some previous conservative appointees, gives a very solid majority of six uh, conservatives. Let me... Um, this is somewhat controversial. Uh, some people object to the idea that um, there are three moderate conservatives versus three harder conservatives. Uh, I, I, th I think it makes some sense, though, uh, if you think that uh, the real difference, and I, I was just going to show, this is a little bit of out-of-date statistic, but uh, to just show you the impact court, uh, Trump had on our courts, he appointed 25% of our district judges, 30% of our court appeals judges, and one-third, no, there's three of nine, of our Supreme Court justices. Um, and you can see there's some more uh, statistics um, about this. Now, obviously, this has changed with Biden, and Biden has had a lot of success appointing lower court justices and has even appointed one Supreme Court justice. Let me mention this last line also is kind of interesting. I, I, being a political scientist, we always recognize that law is very political and that judges' ideologies affect their um, 
judging. It's not just a pure legal matter, especially our Supreme Court. We have a very political Supreme Court. But uh, one law professor has pointed out that it's not just ideology, it's partisanship, and that now ideology and partisanship matches. That's also true of the American public in a way that wasn't true uh, before uh, the sort of changes that started in the 60s and came to fruition under Reagan. Uh, there were many, many Democrats more conservative than many Republicans, and there were at least some Republicans more liberal than Democrats. But that has sort of polarized now so that Republican equates conservative and Democrat equates liberal. And that's happening on the Supreme Court, too. And I think that's important to explain what's going on. Um, I think it makes sense to differentiate among the Republican uh, justices because uh, I don't think it's so much a question of substantive ideology as strategy. Roberts in particular is often portrayed as having a big sense, he's the chief justice, having a strong sense that he needs to protect the institution. That makes him a little slower to produce very shocking decisions because he doesn't want to make the court look political because it can lose legitimacy. And the Supreme Court is, I'm about to talk about it, but it's losing its popularity and approval rating with the uh, American public, and they have an image of it more politically. And so he tries to get, uh, particularly, I think, uh, Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh to go along with him to sort of slow down some of the conservative uh, members who want to make more radical conservative uh, positions. And um, on the other hand, these Alito, Thomas, to some extent Gorsuch, these judges think, well, now we have a majority. We've been waiting a whole generation. The Constitution has been distorted by this constitutional revolution of 1937 that Roosevelt implemented. And now is our time to bring the Constitution out of exile and bring it back into force. And so they, they are not very patient. Uh, I think I will skip that. So, oh, well, I guess I should mention. So I guess I'll just, uh, I'm going to speed up now, I think. Um, but I just I've got a lot of slides about some of the decisions the court has been making for the past few years. The question, I'll just pose it as a question. Are we just seeing a slight turn to the right, which makes sense since our politics have turned to the right? Are we seeing a slight turn to the right in our understanding of constitutional law, um, which makes sense as the judicial appointments have become more conservative, or are we basically seeing? Oh dear, are we basically seeing a counter revolution that would overthrow this radical change of the New Deal in 1937 and bring back this constitutional in, in exile? So uh, I'm just going to mention, I, I will leave my slides because I have more on my slides than I'm able to address. I'm afraid everybody will take a morning nap if I try to talk in detail about all these slides. So you can look later on and they have a lot of names of cases that might be interesting to check out. I, I, I will say, though, I have a couple of slides to just point out. It's a question also of methodology, approach, how does one interpret the Constitution that is changing. Uh, the liberal idea was sometimes called the living constitution, and they used the sort of eclectic approach. But the idea was that the law has to change uh, with social and economic changes to, to be modern and to be appropriate for modern society. Uh, the new conservatives are committed to originalism. Professor Siegel of Georgia State points out, though, that the understanding of what originalism is is slightly different among conservatives. Sometimes it's original intent, which is the intent of the people who wrote the law. So you try to get inside the head of those founding fathers or the people who wrote the uh, important amendments uh, after the Civil War, for instance, versus original intent, meaning what did the law mean 
what did the words mean when it was written, which tends to mean you focus more on the text and the judges get out their dictionaries and try to find out what words meant 200 years ago, et cetera. So, uh, and I also refer to an, a very excellent article by Reva Siegel, who points out that originalism as a theory uh, is supposed to be uh, neutral and supposed to be uh, more restraining to judges because the idea is you see, you look for what the law means, not what you think it ought to mean if you're a judge imposing your views. She's pointing out that in practice, however, given it's so murky what the founders uh, had in mind and words in English are so ambiguous that it often it's like a, uh, an open door to drive a truck through to have your own ideology uh, privilege. So let's just look. Uh, well, there's a sort of summary statement. Um, so just quickly, maybe the most controversial decision is the Dobbs decision two years ago now, I think. And this has gotten the most public attention uh, it's having some political impact, and I think Joe Biden is hoping very much it has a lot more impact in uh, November. Uh, it, it's it's easier to understand, uh, and it's shocking because for 50 years, uh, everybody's come of age uh, and come to accept that uh, abortion, at least in some instances, is legal. It is still restricted, but legal. It's an interesting case where the judges tried to use, or the majority used originalism and original intent, since there's no explicit uh, right in the Constitution to an abortion. It's just, uh, you have to, uh, Alito said we have to look at practice, so he did a lot of history, and uh, the dissent uh, argued mostly for sticking with precedent and said this is bad history. It's law office history. Uh, but also uh, they made the interesting point that it was whose intent matters here because when the uh, original provisions were written, women weren't even allowed to vote. So it's all men's intent if you're going to look at the original intent. Um, similarly, I'm not going to talk about this, but similarly, uh, gun control, you know that we have a huge problem of arms in the U.S. I think something like 35,000 gun deaths per year uh, in the United States. If you compare similar countries in Europe or Japan, it'll be in the tens or maximum the hundreds. We have 35,000. So there's attempts to regulate guns uh, and a very uh, weak but obvious kind of regulation requiring a permit to carry a concealed weapon in New York was overruled by Justice Thomas, again, using uh, sort of historic practices, which to me uh, is ridiculous because historically we didn't have AK-47s and various machine guns and all. So, yes, it's hard to find analogous regulations back in 1805, but that's the sort of epitome of the approach. And again, very controversial politically. Um, last year, affirmative action, at least as practiced by two universities, uh, was struck down. And again, not looking at the legal reasoning so much that uh, the uh, I think the justices, the conservative majority, have a kind of idea of a colorblind um, constitution. Maybe this reflects Jacksonian idea of equal rights for everybody and special rights for none. They think affirmative action is special rights. Uh, and they're somewhat blind to the continuing existence of great uh, inequality uh, and also continuing discrimination. Um, there's a phenomenon that uh, law scholars call First Amendment Lochnerism. A lot of dis, uh, deregulation is taking place in the name of First Amendment. Um, product, oh, 
sorry, product warnings, for example, or mandatory reporting, as one scholar said, you can't have regulation if you can't regulate speech because regulation is always about speech. A very famous case, Janus, a labor case for public employees, uh, struck down agency fees, just fees to cover the price of negotiating a collective bargaining agreement from which the public employee benefits was struck as uh, involving sort of coerced uh, political speech in violation of the First Amendment. Uh, to me, the worst decision the Supreme Court's made, the one that's had the most political impact is Citizens United. It's a little older, 2010. But its reasoning, again, reminds me a little of 19th century and Lochnerian sort of reasoning that corporations of people, corporations have rights, corporations have constitutional rights. One of those rights is uh, free speech. And maybe the worst aspect is that spending money is the same thing as speech. Therefore, trying to regulate money in our elections, which is horrible. We are flooded with uh, a ridiculous amount of money. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, can't be done because of the First Amendment. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about this. I recommend this case and reading about it. Very interesting. <clears throat> it's a web designer. The, the facts were totally controversial. Uh, is a woman who intended to be a web designer. She wasn't yet. And she's worried about a hypothetical uh, customer. There was some in the, the court, some people say got it wrong. They argued there was a customer, but it, it's not true. Uh, might ask her to do a web uh, des a website that endorsed same-sex marriage. And so she asked the Supreme Court to make a decision. Some people say she shouldn't have had standing to sue. But Gorsuch argued it wasn't, a, oh, and it's because of a religious belief, but they treat it as free expression, uh, free speech, not religious liberty. But it's closely entwined, I think. And they said some businesses are so imbued with uh, expressive aspects that the First Amendment free expression would cover it. Um, this has the potential to undermine the entire anti-discrimination rule. It's like I'll choose whether I want to be bound by anti-discrimination. Interestingly, uh, where I'm from, Georgia, many of the people who resisted desegregation and the original Civil Rights Act also uh, said, this is my personal religious belief that races should be kept separate. And so this is not new, but it, depending on definitions, this could have huge impact. <clears throat> I think I need to speed up, but uh, a number of the religious cases uh, are very controversial too. There are a number of cases where the Supreme Court treats it more as property rights, but it ends up limiting the rights of unions and labor to either have access to syndical azar or to uh, have strikes that might have implications for the owner's property. Um, specifically, more liberty of contract cases, uh, epic systems that uh, Joan, I don't know if you're going to talk today about it, but it talks often about it, uh, where the Supreme Court honors a individual contract to arbitrate labor disputes instead of recognizing a collective right to engage in collective uh, activity uh, in the name of uh, preferring arbitration. Uh, for this conference, obviously, who is an employee and who is an independent contractor is the key question. I might add, it's not just gig workers, but the Supreme Court has been narrowing the definition of who's an employee. Both supervisors, maybe 8 million nurses lost their employment status with some of the decisions. And who's a manager who is not an employee, but a manager and therefore not eligible to syndicalize college professors is the key uh, case there. I, I was a college professor for 50 years. I never felt very much like a manager. And in fact, over five decades, as we saw the influence of neoliberalism in the academy, I felt less and less like a manager. 
I'll skip all this. To me, maybe the most interesting, though, is the Supreme Court has had a number of decisions that are sort of collectively seen as major questions, questions do impacto, or as one of my students, uh, Lucas Viana, said, uh, questions do alto impacto. Um, and the court is sort of changing. This is interesting because it's maybe the most political and even partisan example of the way this court is changing the law. Back in the 80s, when the courts tended to be dominated by Democrats and the Reagan administration was running the executive agencies, the Supreme Court came up with an idea of Chevron deference. And that is to say, if the law is not clear whether an agency has authority to interpret the law and make rules and regulations, then the courts ought to defer to the agencies. In other words, the Democrats need to defer to the Republicans. Now that the Republicans are more dominant in the courts and the agencies are making rules about climate change, uh, protecting the environment, this sort of thing, the, this is up for grabs again. And the court is uh, increasingly ruling that some questions are so important that we can't leave it to the executive agencies Interestingly enough, the idea is that it should be up to Congress to specify what the rules are, but the real effect is it leaves it up to the judges to say whether they think various laws are valid or invalid. Okay, so I'm going to hurry. I've got some uh, questions and criticisms about that. It came up not just climate change, which I think is the most important, but it came up during the pandemic about mandatory uh, vaccination. The court struck down a Biden rule uh, requiring vaccination against COVID. Uh, there was a regulation by the CDC, I think, about a moratorium on evictions as a public health measure that the court said, no, that's not valid, too. Um yeah, this is just referring to some of those decisions. Student loans is another interesting example of this, where the court decided to interpret the law rather than let the agency, the Department of Education, interpret the law. Very interesting. It's like reverse Goldilocks. They use the words in the law, uh, particularly modify, and said the forgiveness of a certain amount of loans is too big to be what modify means, but it's too little to be a total waiver. And so the court, rather than the agency, decides to strike it down. And just here's a list of things. If you're a court watcher, a number of cases are coming up. The court is going to uh, or is being asked to decide what the Chevron uh, deference ought to be struck. Uh, there are some things about uh, how executive agencies are financed. Uh, there's some other really important cases coming up that'll, I think, be very controversial in election year. One, particularly for labor law, is interesting. Uh, there's a challenge to the Securities Regulation Commission uh, challenging that administrative law judges shouldn't be able to impose penalties on people who uh, practice fraud in the securities area because it denies a right to a jury trial, uh, et cetera, or that the AL, the judges are not subject to removal uh, by the president and that it violates separation of powers because these agencies sort of combine judicial, executive, as well as uh, legislative powers. Elon Musk is challenging this. Amazon is challenging the National Labor Relations Act. In other words, we may not have a labor law if uh, these cases succeed. We don't have much now, but we may not. Uh, so I've got some summaries, but I think I'm getting the word. I'm filibustering too much. Um, I'll just mention two puzzles. One is a political puzzle. Here's the Supreme Court sort of hollowing out the administrative state, weakening the right for the administrative agencies to regulate the economy and society. At the same time, the politicos around Trump are making plans to 
take hold of the administrative state if he wins and use it to reward his friends and punish his enemies. There is a 900 page plan by the Heritage Institute called the uh, Project 2025. Um, and, and it's very frightening. Maybe I'll, if it gets implemented, maybe I'll be moving to Brazil. Um, but their idea, it's like they didn't get the memo that the administrative state is being diminished because they want to use the administrative state politically. And the other thing I'd like to say is it's sort of interesting, this sort of new conservatism, I generally call it a more libertarian philosophy, like the Lochner philosophy, but at the same time, it wants to regulate uh, the social sphere for s traditional values. So ban abortion, allow school prayer. Uh, it's, it's strong authority as opposed to less authority. And how do you reconcile that? Uh, let me just point out the third one. I think the 303 creative is particularly interesting because you could say it's a decision that favors both wings of the Republican Party. The business wing gets deregulation. You can't have any discrimination law, whereas the uh, more um, evangelical religious wing gets traditional values. These are just three authors that attempt to reconcile the idea of social authority and uh, economic deregulation uh, that I think is interesting. Particularly this Melinda Cooper has the idea that implicit is an idea that families should be the basis of the economy and um, the job of the state is to strengthen, and by families, I mean the traditional male-dominated family. Okay, so I'm going to quit there. I, I've got some slides that is sort of my attempt to read what the alternative views of the Constitution might be. I'll recommend these two books if you want to uh, read two books about con law from a very different point of view, I guess uh, people call this civic republicanism or neo-republicanism. It's not the republicanism of Donald Trump. It's more the republicanism of Abe Lincoln. Uh, but it's an alternative that I find very interesting to both liberalism and to uh, the sort of libertarian conservatism. They also think that there is a sort of economic ideology embodied in the Constitution, but it's a very different economic uh, view they think it's a that to, it's the kind of social economic uh, order that's necessary to have a democratic republic and so it's a very appealing philosophy why don't i stop there i'll just say that we're kind of at an impasse oh, sorry we're at an impasse in the united states politically unfortunately i, I wish i thought but i doubt that this election is going to uh, resolve it because I think it's going to be a close election either way. Um, I'll end with this. This is Yogi Bear, a um, famous baseball player who was kind of a homespun casera uh, philosopher. He said many things that were ridiculous and stupid and uh, yet at the same time had a kind of homespun wisdom. And he said one time, it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So I'll end on this very indefinite note. I will say, I don't know where we're going. Uh, maybe I'll give the answer that is the favorite answer of lawyers everywhere. It depends. Uh, and hopefully maybe this conference can delve into what it depends on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's incredible that we are in different countries and face so similar challenges. So thank you so much. Now we move on and we will listen to um, Professor Mohamed Elian. The professor has over 18 years of experience in law, education, customer service, budgeting, sales, marketing, and management. He received his JG 
uh, an LLM from the University of Minnesota. He also attended Université uh, Panthéon Sorbonne um, and uh, uh, he's a bachelor uh, in law. So thank you so much, Professor. And we are excited to hear, uh, hear from you about biggest challenges to the American judicial system. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can I use my... Of course. Yep. Okay. Do you have to change? No, no, I can sit here. It's good. Good day, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for making this event happen. Um, thank you, Adriana, for inviting me here. It's my first time in Sao Paulo, and I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, it, uh, thank you. Oh, is this on here? Okay. Thank you also for uh, Professor uh, Tippett and Professor uh, Fritas for organizing this event. Um, I want to say first that Professor Gus raised the bar very high because of his, one, his, uh, his uh, Portuguese um, uh, skills and also the depth of his presentation. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, so my presentation today will um, be a part of um, uh, as a mini uh, presentation of what we will talk about next week. Um, both presentations um, are part of a, a course that we have in our law school, um, Intro to American Legal System. And um, it's often a very interactive um, course. So today will just be mostly me talking, but next week, if you are here, get ready to interact more and have activities in, in uh, and in here, he will uh, be in groups and will ask questions. Um, I will print out um, pieces for you and exercises to do here uh, with us. Um, but today, mostly we will be me talking. At the end of the class, if you stick around, we'll have just one activity that we'll do together. Uh, hopefully, you have time um, to get there. I have a long presentation, um, but yeah, I'll try to be as efficient as possible. Um, if there's anything that's unclear, I'm not clear about what I'm saying, let me know, raise your hand, ask questions, and I will repeat. Okay. Um, the topic of today is the judicial, the American judicial legal system, uh, the court system in the United States. Um, which can often be very confusing for those who are not very familiar with it. Um, in the United States, we have two um, court system. We have the federal system and state systems. Um, and often a lot of international students find this um, confusing because sometimes you find a case that can be heard in state court, or sometimes can be heard in federal court, sometimes it can be heard in federal court, but the law applied is a state law. So it can be very confusing. We'll try to navigate these um, issues today as much as we can. Um, courts in the United States often are um, either designed by a state law or constitution. Um, depends on which court we are talking about. But often we have um, the, the, just the, the general two systems, the federal system and the state system. As you all may know that um, United States of America has 50 states and each state has its own law um, and its own constitution, but all the states are under one umbrella of the federal system, which has also its own laws and its own um, court system. Courts are often, um, as many other countries do, um, go through the same structure. We have the trial court, an appellate court, and and then a higher court, sometimes called Supreme Court or the higher court that oversees the decisions of lower courts. Um, trial courts can um, sometimes be called bench trial or bench court that is decided by the judge, or it's sometimes called a jury trial, which is decided by the jury. Um, the jury system is a very interesting system uh, for a lot of our international students because it's a unique system to um, uh, our legal system. And it has um, been a subject of uh, controversy. Every now and then you will hear um, um, calls for um, uh, basically 
abandoning the de jure system. Every few years, we'll find a discussion about that. Um, there are um, people who are pro the jury system, people who are against the jury system, people who are pro the jury system but want to modify it to be more efficient. Um, it can be quite expensive to uh, um, find the juries and then they have to it, it, you hold a lot of uh, hearings and trials. Sometimes the jury also are not very um, well aware of the mechanism that how courts uh, um, um, hear cases. So it can be... Um, a very lengthy and expensive process. But generally speaking, we have the bench trial. This is where the, ju the judge controls the, the entire trial and determines the outcome of the case. Sometimes also we have the jury trial that is um, basically the decision is split between the jury and the judge. Um, it's often said that jury will determine um, the facts of the case and will uh, basically decide on the facts of the case. And the judge will decide on the application of the law on the facts. Um, if you have seen uh, American shows, TV shows, or movies, you see often the jury hearing uh, on the side of the uh, judge and hear from both parties about what happened in the case. Um, and sometimes also the, uh, um, the parties in the case can decide not to have jury at all. So as a party in the case, sometimes if those who are involved in writing contracts, um, you can include in your contract that you don't want the jury, or if you actually want jury, you can determine that. Juries also often listen to testimonies from parties. Um, um, lawyers from both parties present evidence, try to convince the jury with your um, story. Basically, this is what it is. You try, each party try to present their stories and their evidence and try to convince the jury of their uh, narrative of what actually happened. Um, the jury often uh, reach one or actually three verdicts, sometimes called the general verdict. And basically what it is, is the jury can just determine the outcome of the, the case to say the, the either fines for the plaintiff or fine for the defendant. Sometimes also have something called a special verdict. And this is when the court will ask the jury specific questions. For example, here we see, I don't know if you can see. Oh, Sometimes the court will ask the jury, was the defendant negligent? And the jury will say yes or no. Or sometimes it will ask, um, uh, uh, was the negligence proximate co cause of the injury of, of that what happened? And the jury will determine yes or no. Sometimes very specific questions that the jury will have to answer. And sometimes it's just the outcome to say, yes, we'll find for the plaintiff and we'll find for the for the defendant. And sometimes the hybrid for both. It's called the hybrid verdict where um, the verdict would be based on um, the jury and the judge as well. And this is what the trial court is. Um, after the trial court, we have the appellate court. Um, appellate court is a higher court that is um, uh, uh, tasked with basically reviewing the proceedings of the trial court. And the idea is to have a second chance for either defendant or the plaintiff to have another uh, court to look at their uh, uh, argument and determine if the, uh, the, if the trial court was right in its decision or wrong. Um, the appellate court usually don't look at uh, um, uh, um, the facts of the case. You have to look at the application of the law and determine if the trial court um, erred in, it, in it, uh, its application of the law or it actually followed what the law uh, um, um, should be applied. Um, often also, appellate courts are not allowed to look at new evidence or new uh, um, arguments that were not presented in the first uh, um, um, court, the trial court. Um, I think I'm missing a slide here, but um, after, after the appellate court, um, parties of the case have a third and last chance to be heard by a higher court, Supreme Court. Um, sometimes called Supreme Court. A side note about New York that they flip the name. Does have Supreme Court is their appellate court and their appellate court is Supreme Court of other states, which just 
New York being New York. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but the, the, the again, the, the task of the, the, the last court is to basically review the proceedings of the first two courts to determine if they, um, uh, 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 the decision that they reached was, was correct or not. Sometimes the court will um, send the case back again to the trial court to look again at the case and and, and basically try to uh, reach a better decision. Um, the second major topic that we'll discuss today is jurisdiction. And I'm sure you, you and me are all practicing attorneys and you're familiar with the concept of jurisdiction. Uh, if you are in Sao Paulo and then you have um, a, um, an incident that happened in Rio, I assume that you would want to um, uh, take it to a court in Rio instead of a court in, in Sao Paulo and vice versa. Very similar idea. Um, but in the United States, we, we divide that by basically uh, three uh, uh, distinctions uh, of um, uh, jurisdiction. We'll, we'll have the um, uh, subject matter jurisdiction, the subject of the case, um, and the personal or person in, in personal jurisdiction and uh, what's called NREM jurisdiction, was this, which is related to the property. If the, the dispute is over property, um, obviously the, the court where the property is, uh, is, uh, is the one that has jurisdiction over the, over the dispute. Um, the primary function of trial courts is basically just to exercise its original jurisdiction. Um, and um, jurisdiction is often a very strategic uh, uh, decision for uh, the plaintiff or the defendant um, you find the dispute between plaintiff wants the, the court where they decide to uh, hear the case. Defendant sometimes will push back and say, no, I want the, 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 the court in my jurisdiction to uh, uh, hear the case. Um, obviously, if the, both of them, of both the, the plaintiff and defendant are in the same uh, state, uh, uh, these uh, uh, fights will not happen. But if you have two parties, each one of them is from different uh, uh, jurisdiction, you often have this uh, the discussion or, or uh, dispute about which court has the right uh, um, to hear the case. Um, um, sometimes it's, it's a financial decision. If you are a plaintiff and you want to sue someone, you don't want to go somewhere else to hire another lawyer in a different jurisdiction. You want to find a court in your state that is familiar with your law and if, law that you are familiar with to uh, um, hear the case. Um, so it's a it's a, often a very um, it's a, a strategic decision from both parties to determine which uh, um, court should hear uh, the case. This is the structure of the the American uh, court system. So as you see, we have on top uh, the, the the state court uh, final um, court. Sometimes again, it's called Supreme Court. Sometimes called the uh, um, appellate court. Depends on the state. And, and then you have the intermediate or the appellate um, court uh, under it, and then they have the trial court. The trial court system in the United States, um, um, often we have the, 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 uh, the, um, the civil court where that most cases will be uh, um, heard. However, we have a specialized um, courts like appropriate courts, appropriate courts, for example, that hears cases about um, inheritance and wealth and, and things like that. And we have the uh, domestic relations courts uh, for like family uh, law related courts, uh, sorry, um, uh, disputes. Um, likewise, we have the criminal court and uh, um, uh, um, small crime courts um, that else, all of these are under that trial court system. Uh, in terms of the subject matter uh, jurisdiction, and basically the idea is to um, find a court that if you are trying to file um, a lawsuit before trial court, you need to find the court that uh, specialize in the dispute that you are um, uh, want the court to hear. So if it's a land related court, um, a dispute, you might find either this jurisdiction has like a land uh, court or if it's a family law dispute, you will need to find a family uh, law court to file the lawsuit before. Um, a side note, also sometimes a trial court will be called like circuit court or county court or uh, sometimes called a district court, superior court, different names. Each state has its own way of, of uh, naming their uh, trial courts. Um, 
Traditionally, there are two ways for a court uh, to have jurisdiction over a person. Either uh, um, the person has acted in certain capacity in the jurisdiction of the court, or the person has contested or the person actually agreed to have the court um, hear their case. And often also, again, for those who write contracts, you see the um, dispute uh, uh, disputes clause in contracts that will have um, a language that says, okay, if there any dispute, it happens in, in between the parties involved in this uh, uh, contract. For example, states, uh, the courts of California will have jurisdiction or the courts of Texas or New York. So you can determine early on uh, which courts that you want to uh, um, be uh, uh, or have jurisdiction over your dispute. That's, uh, that's one way. Or if you act in certain capacity, in uh, ju the jurisdiction of the court. And if you stick around to the end of the of this presentation, we'll have an activity where we uh, talk about an example of a situation where we'll ask you, where do you think that, the, uh, which court do you think will have jurisdiction over this dispute? One of the ways that um, a person can uh, um, fall under the jurisdiction of a court is just to have what's called a minimum contact with that jurisdiction. Um, sometimes if you're doing business in this uh, jurisdiction or if you um, conducted uh, a deal or if you buying something in this jurisdiction or, or committed a crime in this jurisdiction, all of these are um, enough reasons for a court to have jurisdiction over dispute that the, that the person is involved in. And then we have what's called long arm statues. I don't know if you have something similar to that in uh, Brazil or not, but um, the idea is that, uh, actually, I'm going to ask you, do, does Brazil have similar uh, statue or similar law, like long arm statue? Is, you're not sure? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. so the idea is that a court will have jurisdiction uh, over a dispute if person has just sufficient minimum um, contact with that state. Uh, and we'll see, I mean, that what did, what determines what a minimum is, is something that obviously can be very uh, 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 like a uh, controversial or something that requires a lot of, of uh, discussion, what exactly means by, what we exactly mean by minimum contact, uh, what is actually, what, what constitutes minimum contact in a state. But basically the idea is to, um, you are asking that you sue the defendant before a court, um, and you try to prove the court that this person should be uh, this this court should have jurisdiction over this dispute by showing proof that the defendant had a minimum or enough contact in that jurisdiction that um, gives the court the the, the right to um, hear this case. Um, Jurisdiction over a corporation can also have very similar um, um, context in terms of what uh, um, uh, which court has jurisdiction over a corporation. Um, each um, uh, in order to establish or incorporate uh, uh, a corporation or a company in the mm -hmm. United States, uh, each state, each no, it's okay. <laughs> it's good. Okay. I was just checking the mic. Oh, okay, Sorry. good, good. That's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It works. Yeah, it works. <laughs> it works? Okay, good. I'm just trying to turn it off. Oh. <laughs> um, so each uh, corporation must um, register with the state. Basically, you just must uh, incorporate uh, its uh, files with the state. Um, and that gives the state um, uh, jurisdiction over this uh, um, um, corporation. Um, in... in um, in the United States, you can, um, you find this often happen with, if you are getting involved in corporate law, that many, uh, you hear that uh, uh, companies try, when, when, they, when they are incorporating, incorporating different states where, than where they are uh, physically, where the company is and where the office is. You Often if you hear about um, Delaware, for example, Delaware is a state that has very uh, uh, good uh, uh, corporate laws that a lot of um, companies choose Delaware even though the companies are not physically in Delaware. So you can be in California, for example, or Oregon or uh, New York, but choose Delaware as the state where you uh, incorporate your business. Um, so that can give you enough contact with obviously uh, um, 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 that state, but things can get very uh, confusing when you have um, 
big corporations. Like you think of Amazon, for example, Amazon. Uh, Amazon is based in in Seattle and in, in Seattle, uh, Washington. But uh, I'm not sure where they are uh, incorporated. Probably Delaware too. And but they're doing business all over. So if you want to sue Amazon, where do you sue Amazon? If you live in New York and you order uh, products from Amazon that uh, causes any problems, and you need to, you want to sue Amazon, do you sue them in Delaware or uh, or Washington where they where they are based, or uh, in New York where you live, or maybe sometimes the 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 product came from a fourth state. So all of these uh, questions uh, are often raised around uh, uh, jurisdiction. And if you again, if you are here next week, we'll talk more about this and we'll give, show you, I'll uh, print out with me uh, uh, a few cases to read together and to study and, and have activities to um, see different scenarios where this can be applied. Um, another type of jurisdiction is that what's known as in-rem jurisdiction. In-rem is Latin and, and it's often when uh, uh, the court has jurisdiction over um, a dispute that involves a property that is located in that uh, uh, state of that jurisdiction. So if you have a property of dispute over a piece of land or a house or a building, uh, and they, these are, in our specific jurisdiction, courts where these, uh, this property is that will have off the, the, the general uh, jurisdiction over um, this dispute. That covers the, the, the general idea of the state court system. Uh, in addition to the state court system, we have the federal court system. And again, federal courts are um, uh, um, designed or, or uh, uh, established under uh, or by the power of the Constitution, Article 3, and um, which gives judicial power to the United States, to uh, uh, the Supreme Court, to have um, original jurisdiction over what's known federal question. And federal question, it's a, it's a very long topic. You can talk about it for many uh, lectures, but idea basically that involves federal law. So you have a federal um, uh, dispute or a federal uh, law, like employment law or uh, environmental law or um, securities law. And federal courts will often have um, um, jurisdiction over uh, this type of disputes. Um, the system, of the um, federal court, uh, the federal court system is very similar to the trial uh, uh, court system. We have the uh, what's called the, the trial court in the federal system, often called dis district uh, courts. And then uh, on top of the district courts, we have the courts of appeal. And then you have on top of that the Supreme Court, which what uh, Professor Gas was just talking about. Um, uh, and that is on, on the, the top of the pyramid of the federal court system. Federal court system um, has um, some courts that have limited jurisdiction over certain type of dispute, like tax courts, for example. If there is um, a dispute that involves tax code, uh, federal tax code, uh, a federal court will um, hear this case. Uh, we, are, we also have in New York um, um, a, spe a specialized court called International Trade Court. Um, it's called the U.S. Uh, uh, Court of International Trade that specializes in a dispute that involves like uh, tariffs and imports and customs and uh, disputes related to international court. It's just one court in New York. And then you have the bankruptcy court that uh, uh, hears cases related to bankruptcy. Um, so you have, again, very similar structure to the um, state court system. You have the same uh, uh, three uh, tiers uh, structure. In addition to that, you have the specialized courts that um, hears cases in specific uh, um, um, subject matters. And this is how it looks, the, um, the structure of the um, federal court system. You have on top this, the United, United States Supreme Court and um, uh, follows at the, 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 the appellate, the appellate um, level or the appellate tier. And then after that, you have the district court. And... Um, in a district court or under the district court, um, you have the, the or sorry, separate from district court, you have the tax court, international trade, and uh, um, uh, United States of federal claims. Uh, we'll talk uh, briefly about um, FISC, uh, that what's called the Inter international, uh, sorry, in intelligence surveillance court, um, which is specialized uh, um, federal court. 
there are 94 uh, federal district courts, um, uh, at least uh, one in each state, and then you have um, uh, several uh, district courts in, in, in one state. I think I have a map here uh, coming up soon. I uh, will show you uh, the states, uh, these courts. But again, a very similar structure to the trial um, court system when it comes to uh, subject matter uh, jurisdiction. But um, the main question here is often the federal question, federal law that the court is uh, um, hearing. In addition to the um, um, federal question, you have what's known as state citizenship. So um, state citizenship basically is where you as a person involved in the case reside if you if you are a um, citizen of um, California and you have you are filing a lawsuit against someone who lives in Texas um, often federal court you have the choice you can sue the person in Texas if you want you can sue the person in California if you want or you can choose, uh, sue the person in uh, federal court obviously your decision is not the, the main uh, decider in in, in your manufacturer uh, the court will have to uh, uh, basically approve or um, uh, agree with you that this is this court has jurisdiction over a dispute. Um, but the citizenship is uh, one of the key factors in what's known as diversity cases. Diversity cases where you have two parties or multiple parties in one case from different uh, states. And um, the idea is to avoid... Uh, situations where you have a court that um, um, I don't want to say biased, but a court from certain, a certain uh, jurisdiction uh, seeing a dispute between parties from different jurisdictions. So you have uh, a neutral uh, court. The federal court will hear uh, the case uh, instead of state um, instead of a state court. Um, there are few ways to establish residency or citizenship of, of uh, state. Obviously, if you live in the state, if you're doing business in the state, there are different ways of doing that. Again, we'll talk about that next week. But um, for now, just know that the, the federal court, uh, one of the factors that decide if the federal court had jurisdiction over um, a case or not is uh, the fact where about where the parties are from, if they are from the same state or different states. Um, um, Corporations also have citizenships. Um, so like uh, uh, neutral uh, uh, persons, also corporations also have uh, the citizenship. And what determines that is where the state, where the corporation is incorporated. Again, that we talked about Delaware is as one of the most popular uh, destination for uh, corporations to, to uh, be incorporated at. Um, so that determines where um, the corporation is or uh, as you will see uh, later in the presentation, if the the uh, corporation is doing business in a specific state or doing certain activities in in the state that gives uh, um, that can um, uh, establish uh, citizenship of the uh, of the corporation. Mm -hmm. This is. Um, uh, a table here that shows you like the the district court the distribution of cases uh, from 2016 to 2020 of how many cases as you see the number of cases can vary from depending on the uh, subject of the case um, but um, yesterday I was uh, visiting a uh, labor court was I was Adriana we're talking about the number of cases that are often heard here compared to United States uh, we are a little bit spoiled in United States in terms of the cases uh, judges uh, here. I remember also in Egypt where I practiced law for a few years before I moved to the States, uh, uh, you go to the uh, courtroom and you find like a, in the morning if you uh, if you are, uh, have a, a hearing, like a long list that have like probably 200 cases per one day. But um, when I moved to the United States and I, I, I clerked for uh, judge duty in uh, United States District Court in Minneapolis, um, I was surprised to find out that we have just one hearing per day. And uh, I was confused, like how come just one hearing, just one case a day? Um, but um, uh, still, the the um, uh, was which one of the subjects we'll talk about in, in the next week. The challenges that uh, court system in the United States faces face in terms of the number of cases still 
um, and the, how expensive it can be on the legal system and uh, the uh, people involved in um, litigations. Um, if, if you remember, uh, we talked earlier about how we can bring someone before a court that is outside of their own jurisdiction. Um, this so person can basically, defendant can be sued in a state court. Um, you can have the right to remove um, the case to a federal court. So if you live again in California and you have a dispute with someone in Texas and you sue them before um, California court, where you live, where your lawyer is, where you are familiar with the law, where it's easier for you. This person who lives in Texas doesn't want to go to California, doesn't want to hire a lawyer in California. Lawyers in California are very expensive, they want, doesn't want to go there. So they have the option what's to do what's known as remove. They can re remove all. They can remove the case from a state court to a federal court. Um, obviously, that requires... Um, Again, that there is a federal uh, question that has to be raised, or um, there are the requirements of um, citizenship. So, if the party is still in 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 in, in the both parties are in California, uh, you still can have a federal court uh, hear the case, but that will have to be a federal uh, question. Uh, but in if the both people are from different states, um, defendant can choose to remove the case from. Um, a state court to a federal court. Um, there is a doctrine, it's called the Erie doc Doctrine, and basically what this says that if there is um, a court, a case that has been removed from a state court, that that, that person who didn't want to um, um, court in California to hear their case and want to move it to a uh, federal court, in this case, federal, federal court will, would have to apply um, uh, uh, or can apply basically a state law. So a uh, federal court, that's why I said earlier that can be confusing to some that we have the state court, the state court system that applies state law, and we have federal courts that apply federal court, uh, federal law, but sometimes you have federal courts that apply state law. And this is the case here. We have um, a situation where someone removes a case from state court to a federal court, and the federal court applies state law. Uh, on top of the, the um, um, district courts, that is the equi equivalent of the trial court in the, tri in the state law system, we have what's known as the appellate court. There are uh, appellate courts that hear cases that involve, um, or uh, cases that if you um, form parties that were involved in uh, cases that were heard by district courts, or people are, if, if the party is not happy with the outcome of the case and disagrees with the uh, district court decision, they have the right to appeal uh, before the appellate court. Um, and, and and again, um, very similar idea of that the federal court now, uh, or the appellate court, will not rehear the case from scratch. We basically, will just determine whether um, district court uh, applied the law uh, correctly or not. And if it didn't, it will send back again the, 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 the district court to rehear the case. Any questions so far? Everything is clear. Okay. So that, that is the um, structure of the um, um, thirteen um, appellate, thirteen federal uh, appellate courts. As you see, some of this. Um, um, I don't know if it's clear here, but you see, for example, you have like number uh, five here. That is the appellate court number. District number five will will, will hear the cases here in this in this area here. You have nine here, for example, we'll hear cases that are related in this area here. So it's not um, like district court where each um, state has its own district court, but appellate court will have will hear cases from different states. Does it have, it's not uh, the same as a state court system where you have every state has um, trial court and federal court and Supreme Court. It's not the case here. We have district courts, many different co district courts, different structure. And then on top of that, we have only 13 appellate courts. And on top of that, as we will see soon, we have just one Supreme Court. Um, in top of the appellate court, um, a federal appellate court, we have the Supreme Court. And this is a picture of the current uh, residing uh, justice of the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, 
Um, and again, they uh, review uh, cases that uh, were heard previously uh, in uh, appellate and uh, district courts. In certain situations, we'll hear directly cases, uh, but very specific uh, situations where you don't have to go through the district and the appellate court. You can directly go to uh, Supreme Court, as we'll talk about that later. And this is the structure of the numbers of um, type of cases that were heard by the United States Supreme Court. As you see, some of them are criminal cases, some of them, uh, some of them are U.S. civil cases or private civil or administrative appeals. Um, yeah. Uh, if you recall from the structure of the, the flow chart that we had previously, we uh, there was a, um, a separate court that is this is, doesn't go under the same structure of the district in appellate in the Supreme Court system. It's what's known as the foreign intelligence surveillance courts, and these are specific courts that were um, created in uh, 1978. And the goal of this for the the the, 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 the specific jurisdiction of this case to uh, consider is his um, warrants of domestic uh, domestic uh, surveillance and national security agents. Uh, there's a case that or in a, a situation where you have um, a warrant that is um, issued against someone uh, like basically spies or like someone who has a um, risk of uh, domestic surveillance um, uh, or actions. And the will, this court will determine the, uh, the these type of warrants. As you see here, um, so there are often like three federal judges all appointed by the Chief Justice of the U.S. These are the current members of the um, the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, on top of it will be the Justice uh, uh, Trenga. He is a presiding uh, just, uh, judge, judge of the court now. He's from the uh, District of Virginia. And the term of... Um, of judges in this court is seven years, and you don't. Uh, it's not. And it's not renewable. So after seven years, you have to choose someone else to substitute the uh, judge who has uh, left the seat. Um, in the last few years, these are the numbers of cases that were heard by Fisk. Um, some of them were approved. Some of them were denied. As you see, there is um, and the number fluctuates by. Um, years but also fisk has the court has the right to modify the warrant uh in how uh, uh, how the court see if it's needed or not and how much warrant and what, what, what the court wants to um, give to the agency involved in the warrant okay that uh, brings me to the end of uh, my presentation but before uh, we end it i just want you to take a few minutes to um, Spend some time in this case here, in this activity. We'll think about it and uh, we'll test you and see if you are listening or not. <laughs> oh, 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 Lion. Oh, yeah, sure. The... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and this is uh, this case is that uh, was uh, heard by the United States Supreme Court. It's called Ford uh, versus uh, Bandimer. And Ford is the, the car manufacturer, Ford. Um, basically dispute over uh, whether Minnesota state court has jurisdiction over um, uh, the case. And in this, the facts of this case that um, a person named uh, Adam uh, Bendemer, he was a resident of um, Minnesota and he was injured where his car was hit from the back and the airbag didn't uh, um, uh, open, ended up uh, causing him to have a serious brain damage. Uh, injury. So he sued um, Ford before the state court, and now Ford didn't like this. Ford said, "Well, we don't. We're not in Minnesota. We we, we don't have a we don't have company in Minnesota. We are based in Michigan. Um, the car was not made in Minnesota, um, and uh, basically Ford didn't want Minnesota uh, court to hear the case." Um, uh, at first, the, the, the trial court agreed with the plaintiff that the, the Minnesota has jurisdiction. And then um, Ford appealed the, the decision to the appellate court, which also uh, um, uh, agreed with the first uh, uh, or the trial court. Eventually, the, the case reached the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, that had to decide whether um, 
the Minnesota 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 courts basically has jurisdiction or not. Um, again, um, the, the the argument of court is that the car was manufactured in um, Kentucky or Canada. This word they have, have the manufacturer. Um, Ford is in Michigan, but um, uh, and um, and the plaintiff bought the car in private sale in Minnesota. So, who here thinks that Minnesota courts should have jurisdiction over the case? Who agrees with Minnesota courts here? If you agree with Minnesota courts, raise your hand. Okay. Who? Yes, yeah. So we have the again the plaintiff. He is um, a resident of uh, Minnesota, and he sued Ford Ford in uh, in Minnesota. But Ford is not in Minnesota. Ford is is based in in Michigan. So who here who here agrees with Ford that Minnesota courts shouldn't have jurisdiction over the case? No one. No one likes Ford here. Minimum contact, yes, that's that's a good a good yeah good thing to look at it. The amount, yes, yeah. Uh, one of the um, issues here was um, contact. So what is remember when we talked earlier about minimum contact? What what actually can you use minimum contact? Um, again, oh, here we go. The plaintiff's argument is that uh, Ford is is an international company. Um, they are for dice cars all over, and they have um, they sold more than two thousand cars in that state in Minnesota. Um, he claimed that um, it doesn't matter where the car uh, where where the, where the company is. The car was sold in Minnesota, and that should be enough to build a case that. Um, Ford has um, um, enough contact with the state of Minnesota. Um, so obviously we don't have um, time now to, to, to uh, divide any groups, but um, so the, 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 the case reached the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court had to decide whether um, um, Minnesota courts have uh, jurisdiction over uh, the case or not. Uh, I see. I asked you earlier if you agree with uh, which which one you agree with. I didn't see a lot of fans here of Ford, but uh, that is actually the decision of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that yes, Minnesota courts have jurisdiction over the dispute because uh, by by going to by advertising your cars in Minnesota and um, selling cars in Minnesota, basically the court said to Ford, that is enough. You know, you should know that every state that you advertise your cars in, every every state you sell your car in, um, that should be enough contact with the state to establish jurisdiction in that in that state. And that was enough uh, from the court's perspective to um, uh, build your um, jurisdiction on, in, in, in the state of Minnesota. Well, that's it for me today. Um, thank you for being with me here today. Uh, if you are here next week, we'll talk more about this topic. And as I mentioned, we'll have more hands-on experience. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Professor Mohamed. Uh, now uh, we will listen João Renda. Uh, who is a labor judge here in Rio de Janeiro Labor Court. He uh, holds a master's degree and he's a PhD candidate in labor law and social security law at Rio de Janeiro State University. So thank you, João. Now you have a, a difficult mission, right? <laughs> to, to finish and close this debate. The floor is yours. I don't know if you have any presentation. No. no? So thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Professor Olivia, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. I thank uh, Professor Freitas, Professor Adriana, and also Professor Tippett, and I congratulate you for this fantastic event. I know how difficult it is to make an international event like this, so mm -hmm. congratulations. And I really miss meeting Professor Tippett in person. Uh, I think we, we met in 2018 in Japan, in a fantastic event in Japan and also in 2019 here at Ushpi again. And I think she was speaking from Oregon, right? 
So it was like four or five a.m. in Oregon. So I I hope she got some sleep after her her speech. But it's a challenging task for me to to speak after to to excellent lectures, and I also congratulate both professors and and I would like to to give a warm welcome, especially for the American professors. And I hope we can receive you also in Rio. The other day, Professor Cochran was saying that, uh, I shouldn't say that actually, that he loves Paraná. His heart is in Sao Paulo because of E2 and he loves Sao Paulo, but Rio is Rio. <laughs> <laughs> but I love being in Sao Paulo. We have relatives in Sao Paulo. My mom's family is from Sao Paulo. And it's a, a great pleasure being here, but it's challenging because it's before lunchtime <laughs> and it's in English too. So I think it's a kind of revenge of Professor Cochran because I always make him <laughs> give lectures in Portuguese. <laughs> and I think in 2022, when he came to Rio, he had three lectures within, or I think in less than 24 hours. And he said it was the uberization of his work on demand. <laughs> but uh, also, my apologies for destroying all the beauty of Shakespeare's language. And it's a, a disclaimer. And also, uh, also a disclaimer that I, when I talk about American law, of course, I think I'm a little bit biased because I see it with my own perspective and we have a completely different legal background in Brazil. The way we teach law is completely different in Brazil, but so it's a hard task to, to analyze and to talk about your, and about a foreign legal system. Uh, well, just for the records, it's also an honor to be with uh, Professor Elian and with Professor Cochran. Professor Cochran has been studying our labor and employment law uh, so deep, and I received him in my trial court for a couple of times. And it's very interesting to, to see Professor Cochran, for example, taking notes of our legal vocabulary like contradita da testemunha, like when you were <laughs> challenging a witness and he takes notes. And, and I saw that he had three glossaries of our legal vocabulary and focused on labor and employment law. And that's why I proposed him, oh, let's try to make a glossary of that because I think it's also very important to show a little bit of our labor and employment law system, especially for, for, for foreigners. But after the hearings the other day, I asked him, oh, what was the most impressive aspect of our hearings for you? And I thought he would say something about the speed, something about the, the lawsuit uh, system uh, that we call PJE, but his answer was very interesting. He said, oh, the most impressive thing is the creativity of Brazilian to name people. <laughs> the first hearing, the plaintiff's name, her first name was Lady Diana. <laughs> and the company's representative was Charles. <laughs> and they made an agreement. <laughs> And I told him it was in Nova Iguaçu, in Rio Lowlands. This is the only place in the world where you're going to see Lady Diana making an agreement with Charles. <laughs> but I think he also met Rocky Balboa, Cassius Clay, and a lot of people. Uh, but it's really an honor to, to have Professor Cochran there. And I think it's really an honor for us. Uh, from the labor law sector in Brazil to have a foreign professor studying uh, very deeply our our system. And also a, a personal observation that for me, uh, I'm very happy today because I'm receiving my niece here at BIA uh, and also my brother-in-law, Claudio. Claudio is an angel, has been married with my sister for 20 years. <laughs> 
but I love my sister and but Bia is studying and she's applying uh, to to enter in a law school and I was telling Bia that every time I come to this environment of USP I always want to study at USP and I was not an undergraduate student here I was not a master student here I was not a PhD student here but maybe a postdoc and who knows the future because I always feel like this. So maybe I can study here once and I, I would really love to do that. Well, uh, but starting to talk about the lectures and, and about what we came to, to, to talk about, uh, I must say, and especially for Professor Elian, it's very interesting to to hear and to hear a little bit about your legal system, because your legal system is a kind of paradigm for all of us. Uh, you were talking a lot about Delaware, and for example, we passed a statute in 2019, and it's the Lei da Liberdade Econômica, it's the Freedom Economy Act, and in the reports in the House and also in the Senate, they were quoting Delaware as an example to be followed to create jobs, but they were thinking that the jobs were created in Delaware <laughs> and the jobs are in other places. They use Delaware just to incorporate. And sometimes we, we quote the American system as an example to be followed, but, uh, Sometimes the quotations are out of context. For example, we had Janus quoted in our Supreme Court, I think three times, but they don't uh, understand that Janus is a case about the public sector and they are quoting Janus for the private sector. Janus is about agency fees like contribuição assistencial to pay for the collective bargaining process. And in the US, when they quote Janus, they don't mention that in most in like half of the states, I think 24 states, because Michigan, I think now it's a non-right to work state, but in 24 states, it's allowed in the private sector when it's a unionized workplace. And when they, they quote Janus, they don't get it. And they are quoting as if it applied to the private sector. And I think we also have a kind of complex of inferiority and there was a famous writer in Brazil called Nelson Rodriguez. He had a, a name for that. It's a kind of street dog complex. And when we see the U.S. and when we see American law and the American legal system, sometimes people people quote the American legal system and, oh, we should try to follow them. And I think like two or three weeks ago, the American Supreme Court was quoted as an example to be followed by one justice from our Supreme Court, uh, the same who quoted Janus at least twice. <laughs> and, and so it's very important for us to get to know, and it's very important for us to, to hear about your experiences and about your challenges and, and things that uh, go well and things that uh, don't go well. Because sometimes we think we are going to have an American dream, but we can also have an American nightmare. For example, your labor law system in the private sector, when you ask someone, do you want to work in a unionized workplace? Do you approve unions? 70%, I think, uh, according to the Gallup uh, poll, 70% say yes, we would like to, to be unionized. And it's not I think it's not about ideology. It's something really pragmatic. They know if they if they work in a unionized workplace, they will get higher wages. They will receive more benefits. They will probably have a collective bargaining agreement. And but on the other hand, only six percent in the private sector work actually in unionized workplaces. And a super ultra adversarial system like elections, captive audience speeches sometimes. And uh, I think for lawyers, it's very good because, and if you deal with labor law, because what is a prediction and what is a threat? Because the employer can predict, but uh, the employer cannot uh, make a threat, for example. Oh, and when the employer 
says, oh, I'm going to, to shut down this, this plant. I'm going to close this store. And it's firm by firm. It's so hard. That Starbucks store, which has like seven employees, they it's like David against Goliath and a, a super complex system. And our system is completely different. So when we quote the the American labor law, we have to try to to put it in in context. But uh, many quotations and. We are talking about Lochnerism in a gig economy seminar. And we recently had Oliver Wendell Holmes' dissenting opinion quoted by Justice Fakin in the STF, in our Supreme Court, in a dissenting opinion, quoting expressly, like uh, more uh, a century ago opinion being quoted in the Brazilian Supreme Court. And I think we have to learn and we have a lot to learn with Holmes' uh, dissenting opinion. First thing to learn is how to be concise, how to be uh, straight to the point. Three paragraphs and a landmark decision that we still study uh, nowadays. And it's also very interesting in, in your uh, American law schools, and I remember that I, I think we are much more prolix in our law schools here. And when I went to the U.S. to study there, uh, like the professors used to reply sometimes using three words: <laughs> no, dear, no, uh, best regards, no, just sometimes just yes, no, come to my office at three, <laughs> things like this, and. Uh, and our legal environment is is really different. And in each case of our Supreme Court, for example, and in our Court of Appeals, each judge, uh, each Court of Appeal judge or each, each Court of Appeal justice issue his or her own opinion for every case. And sometimes I think we, we should follow your example. The, the American experience is interesting for that, is the... Uh, or seriatin and percurian uh, systems, and it's very it's very interesting. Another thing that was very interesting for me in the U.S. I think I I went to labor and employment law classes for like a an year and a half, and I think I've never heard about the ILO, the International Labor Organization. It was just case law, and the way you teach law. I think we have a lot to learn with the way you teach law, more pragmatic like preparing people to to the market and but i think we we have some very good aspects in our legal formation which is more humanistic philosophical sociological especially in the beginning of law school and we have like college of law it usually takes uh five years and and it's very interesting to see and i started to study a little bit how the the case method developed with Christopher Langdale in Harvard and how it spread. And, and it's very interesting to see that uh, it's so pragmatic and so technical, the the legal education in the US. And, and also I think for uh, a very important reason because people usually pay a lot of money to be in the law school and it's a graduate program like post-graduação after they graduate in college they go to, to a graduate program and, and and they are in law school and they need to pay uh, for law school and they usually pay after law school practicing uh, law. But we we must take we must be careful about these legal transplants that we that we usually do in Brazil, uh, bringing some American institutes and quoting American cases so. Uh, that's the reason why I think this seminar is so important and that I congratulate again all the, the organizers. Because our Supreme Court, uh, in the past few years, I think it became especially with the case of outsourcing, terceirização, which we, we have some numbers for like binding precedents. It's topic 725. Because first of all, the, the precedents from the labor courts, and especially from the superior labor court, the precedents uh, said that the companies can outsource their activities except 
their core business. So uh, an aviation company, for example, wasn't able to outsource uh, and hire, for example, outsourced pilots or flight attendants. But for other services, they, they, they were able. But the Supreme Court said you can outsource all your activities. And it kind, I would say that it opened the floodgates for Lochnerism and for this uh, super uh, valorization of freedom of contract. And I can quote, while I was listening to, to your lectures, I was just uh, like bullet pointing here. We had other cases like penalties for employers who don't pay vacations on time that we had a binding precedent from the Superior Labor Court, which was uh, in it was struck down, struck down by the, the the STF, our Supreme Court. They also decided during the pandemic, and this decision was so activist, I think, because our constitution in its article seven says that uh, you cannot reduce wages and working hours without a collective bargaining agreement. But the Supreme Court said during the pandemic, and the argument was basically crisis. We are in a huge crisis. And they said an individual agreement is fine. But the Constitution doesn't say that. And it's written in the Constitution. So I think sometimes we have a kind of selective activism. And they criticize a lot the labor courts. And I'm a judge. But we are in the academic environment, so I'm free here to 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 show my my personal belief. Uh, and and sometimes I think they lack some labor and employment law background, actually, because they are general they are general clinic and and uh, labor lawyers. We and we know the reality sometimes in a in a labor and employment law case in in a in a hearing room and well other cases like the statute of limitation for claims regarding the severance pay fund uh every employee in brazil has a severance uh pay fund and the employer must pay 8% of their salary and people here usually receive salaries it's per month and it's much harder to calculate overtime for example because we need to divide the monthly wage uh, per the average hours worked per month so it's a completely different system and but the statute of limitation for claims regarding the severance pay fund because article 7 says oh we have the uh, the most important employment rights here but it doesn't exclude other rights provided by statutes or by by other uh, sources, and and we had a statute saying, oh, the statute of limitation is of thirty years because sometimes it's a lifetime employment, and but they said, oh no, we are going to follow the Constitution's Article Seven five-year statute of limitation, prescrição quinquenal. So you can only claim the last five years if the employer was not paying and depositing it correctly. Uh, you can only claim the last five years. A case about inflation adjustment, correção monetária, uh, and juros and interest for labor and employment debts. And the law had an index for that, and the statute had an index for that. Uh, but the Supreme Court also struck down and, and defined another criteria of getting this, this kind of uh, index. So, uh, and sometimes we, uh, the sensation is that the, the Supreme Court, they are acting in everything, in their jurisdiction, their competencia, that we say competencia, is so broad right now because our constitution is, is broad and they are deciding a lot of stuff and sometimes to overturn some superior labor court uh, precedents. And, and so the labor courts, it's very hard. And as I said, I think the, the outsourcing case kind of opened 
the floodgates for uh, this Lochnerism in our Supreme Court. And now the, the most clear example is the, the case of pejotização. Pejotização, it's very hard. And I, I, I checked in the glossary <laughs> because it's so hard to translate. Pejotização is an artificial entity contract. When you hire someone, for example, you have a, a restaurant and you need someone to deliver your food and, oh, I'm going to hire João, but please, João, uh, I'm not going to hire you. You must incorporate and become a legal entity. And so I don't want to hire João as a natural person, as a physical entity. I want to hire João Inc. <laughs> and it won't, you are, of course, you are not going to be an employee. It became very common, especially uh, in like higher and like white collar workers. Yeah, engineers, lawyers. There are many cases about lawyers. And in the Supreme Court, the, the, the new trend is like allowing this. And I think Professor Tippett mentioned this uh, huge difference of this freedom of contract. And we are like really turning back time. And the cases are coming to courts. And we actually don't know exactly because according to the constitution, we should be able to analyze the facts and we have our own tests. And it's so hard about American employment law because they have these tests, ABC tests, and now the NLRB has the Atlanta Opera and I was studying the, the tests. And sometimes those tests are, are very hard to understand all the elements. And you have like federal agencies, the NLRB, especially in when it's a Democrat government, they change the, the test. When it's a Republican government, they change the test. And, and it's hard for us to even to follow and to update articles and books because the test, sometimes uh, there is a strong variation. But this problem of uh, pejotização, artificial entity contracts, we don't even know. For example, the other day, my brother was asking me, oh, is it okay? And my brother is in the civil construction sector. Is it okay if I hire an engineer as a, a legal entity? And I said, an engineer, well, according to the Supreme Court, a white collar worker receiving higher wages, it's safer, I would say. But he also asked me, and what about hiring a janitor for janitorial services? And I said, I think a janitor would be much more. And sometimes you are. And I usually say that uh, being a lawyer and, uh, well, uh, talking to, to your clients, sometimes it's just analyzing risks. And we don't know exactly where we are going. As Professor Cochran said, it's so hard to make predictions and the quoting the, the baseball player, especially about the future. <laughs> and that's why talking about Lochner and Lochnerism is so important in a gig economy event right now, because it's a trending topic. We don't know what is going to happen. We will possibly have a, a regulation for drivers uh, in the future, I think probably this year, the house and, and it, they made a kind of agreement, I think, with the, the most important company, especially Uber, but they couldn't do it with DoorDash, for example. We don't have DoorDash here. We, we have a giant called iFood. It's a Brazilian company and for delivery workers, and they were not able to, to get an agreement with them. But I think we, we are going to regulate. And I think there's a lot of inspiration in the Prop 22 of California. They are providing some rights, but they are very far uh, to be considered employees, for example. And, and we, we must talk about that. We must talk and we must provide uh, rights, especially social security rights, and we must provide some social protection. Because even if we think about uh, in, in some analysis, uh, considering only economic aspects, if we don't provide social protection, 
the state will pay the bill at the end because we have to pay uh, assistential benefits and it's much better if we try to to provide some some social protection from my point of view but the american cases the american cases are are very interesting for us to to be studied uh, i like to quote uh, as professor cochran said usually epic systems for me, when I was studying uh, American law, American labor and employment law, this was a kind of landmark case. And uh, it took me a while to realize what was going on because in the US it's so expensive, as Professor Elian mentioned, it's so expensive sometimes to bring a lawsuit in court. To litigate in court, it's very expensive. You have like 150 hours to claim of overtime it's not worth. Sometimes you are going to spend a lot of money. It won't be uh, interesting for a lawyer to take the case. If you have a, a strong sexual harassment case, maybe, but an individual case, sometimes it's very hard to adjudicate, to bring it to courts. They have uh, federal agencies like the EEOC for uh, employment discrimination cases. Uh, in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, for example, they had the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination for Employment Discrimination Cases, and it's a it's a compulsory step. You must go there, and the lawyers complain a lot about that because it takes time, and they they cannot go to court, and then sometimes the case is not resolved uh, within a specific uh, period, and and then the agency just. Uh, gives them a right to sue la letter and then they go to court. So sometimes it makes things even harder. And Professor Cochran uh, took me to, to, and we met some lawyers and they complained about the agencies and, and they complained about uh, employment law in Georgia too. <laughs> One of them said, when I die, I don't want to go to heaven <laughs> and I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to California <laughs> because life is so much better for labor and employment lawyers <laughs> there. And and we, when we compare litigation, it's also interesting because when you see the numbers uh, of cases in our labor courts, I know it's impressive, but actually you are comparing numbers of all these agencies state because the, the Brazilian federalism is much is really different from the American federalism and labor and employment law is federal. So only from the federal government and the labor courts are federal. So we basically do uh, what the workers' compensation boards do because like accidents and occupational diseases, we deal with all this stuff. Uh, NLRB for sure, labor cases, unionization, strikes, and the other day I I attended a, a lecture. It was one of the most interesting lectures that I that I attended. I think in the past few years about a hacker attack to the Spiritus Santo state lawsuit system, the PJE. They didn't have the PJE for 17 days because of a, a hacker attack from Russia. And people complain a lot about labor courts in Brazil. And like uh, business complain a lot and the unions complain a lot. So I think we maybe we have some merits. <laughs> everyone complains. So, <laughs> and uh, they didn't have the, the lawsuit system for the records for 17 days and in the state capital a strike of bus drivers began. And of course, they received uh, a claim. And they, and I think the, and we have employers unions and the employers union asked for an injunction to stop that strike. But everything is not in paper anymore. It's, a, it's an electronic system, and they didn't have the electronic system. Actually, I forgot to ask him how they did, but I think they sent by email to the chief judge, and I think it was a lottery, like in the old style, because uh, we have a reporter 
when a case go to a court of appeal, we have a reporter. There is one court of appeal judge assigned to be the reporter of each case. And I think they, they had to do it in old style, maybe in paper. I don't know how they did it, but I, I really want to know, actually. And But Epic Systems, it's so expensive to, to adjudicate a case in the U.S., and but on the other hand, you have class actions, and it's so interesting for us. Our collective uh, proceedings developed a lot, especially after the eighties. But our labor and employment law system, our labor court system, our labor procedure system, is focused in individual claims. It's the plaintiff there, and the judge usually receives the, the claim. And it's what we call, an, uh, we have oral proceedings. We Our labor code, it's a civil law system, and our labor code uh, says that we must have a hearing and because the judge must try to conciliate uh, the, the parties. And if they don't conciliate, we receive the, the defendant's response. And then we check uh, which evidence we must be provided in and must be produced on each case. Sometimes expert witnesses, sometimes uh, like only hearing witnesses. And but based on individual case, and Epic Systems was about arbitration clauses and arbitration clauses that say that every conflict will be resolved only through individual arbitration. And it really, uh, it and they, they call it class waivers because they are not able to bring class actions anymore. And class actions are a very important uh, tool for uh, to bring uh, claims about labor and employment things. And from my point of view, it's also strange because Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act expressly provides some protection for mutual aid or uh, and mutual aid or concerted activities, right? Or protection. And it's uh, expressly said that uh, in, in this statute of what we call collective labor law, and for us, employment law is individual. Uh, we call it individual labor law and, and labor law, unionization and collective bargaining agreements. For us, it's uh, collective labor law. That's how we call it. And the Federal Arbitration Act was is from 1925, I think, right? And it was enacted before the National Labor Standards Act, the, the National Labor Relations Act, which is from 1935. And it prevailed all this this kind of arbitration clause providing that every conflict will be resolved only through individual arbitration is okay, is fine. And the dissenting opinion by Justice Ginsburg in that case is very interesting and in talking about take it or leave it. And this is a very interesting expression that they, they have in American English take it or leave it clauses, né? a cláusula de pegar ou largar. When we are talking and discussing consent in, in employment contracts and in employment agreements, it's very interesting because sometimes consent is really mitigated. Sometimes the bargaining power, they are not uh, in the same level. But many cases, and I think I, I don't have so much time, and... Yeah, and five minutes I will try to to finish, and it's very hard to to <laughs> to be before lunchtime. But you mentioned some cases like National Federation of Independent Business v. OSHA, uh, and it's about a federal regulation of like uh, that made compulsory a, a vaccine or test uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so it was a, a vaccine or test rule, and the Supreme Court. Uh, said uh, it was not valid, it was unconstitutional, and Professor Cochran explained much better about the Chevron deference and how 
it changes because sometimes you you have a, a, a democratic uh, president and a conservative Supreme Court and things change and major questions. And I, I think in this case, in Gorsuch's uh, concurring opinion, he expressly quoted uh, major questions, right? And uh, Cedar Point Nursery and how the unions are in trouble in the American Supreme Court. We had a, a, a recent case last year, Northwest from last year, and Professor Cochran also mentioned. And sometimes the American Supreme Court uh, seems to be very uh, uh, Lucknerian. But on the other hand, just like our Supreme Court, I see some... <laughs> selective activism in other cases and sometimes they they say oh the state the government should not intervene in private relations and labor and employment things are private relations basically but in other times strategically they intervene genos is one example because genos if we are talking about consent and I, I read that article of uh, Samuel Bagenstos, so interesting, that article, because he, sa he says, if it's about consent, when it's a unionized workplace, because the employees decided they wanted to unionize, and most of the times because uh, the unions won an election or because they were voluntarily recognized as the representative, uh, they, that environment is unionized. They have a collective bargaining agreement negotiated between the employer and the union. And the person who is going to work there, he or she knows that uh, they will work in a unionized environment and that there is a collective bargaining agreement and there is compulsory uh, agency fee. It's about consent. So the Supreme Court should just leave it and it's about consent, should not interfere. And it's a very interesting approach and showing how it's a little bit contradictory, uh, the, 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 the views of the Supreme Court in some cases. Like Bostock, Bostock v. Clayton County, it's a case of 2020, because maybe the, the most popular uh, employment uh, statute in the U.S. is Title VII of the 1964 uh, Civil, Rights, Civil Rights Act, and it says that uh, you cannot discriminate because of sex, because of sex. And it's not like our statute uh, about employment discrimination, because our statute says you cannot discriminate because of sex, because of religion, blah, 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 among other uh, elements. Their statute has a straight... Uh, the, the the elements that are expressed and that are written there, they are the only elements. They don't have this among others. And because of sex, the Supreme Court in the 80s, and Professor Cochran has a book on that case. Uh, what's the name? And it's usually uh, referred as the name of the bank, Meritor Bank. But I prefer to quote as the name of the girl who fought a 19-year-old girl, Vanson, Michelle Vanson, Michelle Vanson v. Meritor Savings Bank. And they said, oh, this uh, statute that prohibits discrimination because of sex, it also prohibits uh, sexual harassment. And this was a sexual harassment case. And in 2020, they received another uh, case uh, basically asking if... Uh, discrimination because of sexual orientation was illegal according to the Title VII, which forbids uh, discrimination because of sex. And they said yes. They said yes. Uh, Ultra-conservative Supreme Court said yes. They didn't follow originalism, I think, in this case. It's hard to say. Yeah, it's hard to say, but it's impressive. And actually, I, I asked Eric Siegel, who wrote the, the book, Originalism as a Faith, about that case. And he gave me some personal <laughs> explanations uh, 
about why he thinks the the justice is uh, decided that case and Dobbs and Dobbs I I'm not going to to talk about it it's super controversial and like overturning role but it's it's from my point of view it's a kind of activism and but just to finish uh, it's so important to 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 hear from foreign professors it's a uh, it's really an honor for us and I think we should just uh try to think if we are if we are not like turning back time there is a, a song by a, a brazilian singer called cazuza that i like to quote uh in portuguese it's it says cansado de correr na direção contraria and uh it's like tired of running in the opposite direction and he says eu vejo o futuro repetir o passado i see the future repeating the past Eu vejo um museu de grandes novidades. I see a museum of great novelties. But he says, o tempo não para. Né? O tempo não para, não, não para. Time doesn't stop. So sometimes it's a cycle and we are going to discuss a lot of things in, in the future about uh, all of this. Thank you very much. It was uh, an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Henga. So considering the time, we won't have uh, time for questions, but uh, I need to mention that all of them will be here with us during the event. So there is time to, to talk about uh, these topics later. And Adriana um, asked me to remind her that Professor Elian uh, will be here with us next week and is available to talk about LLM and summer courses in Oregon University. So thank you for this, Gentil. Thank you, and we are ready for the lunch. Thank you, bye-bye. Just uh, an announcement here. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed this morning session. We are going to have our break for lunch and we will return at 2 p.m. And you are all invited to join us in 2.30. Perfect, thank you. We are all going to have another session in the afternoon for platform work and economy with Mr. Renan Bernardi Calil, Wilson Aparecido Costa, and Marcelo Manzan. You are all invited to join us. Thank you. <laughs>